Okay, you can go ahead and start. Good evening. This is Chair Hemalata Dandekar, and I'd like to call this regular meeting of the Planning Commission to order. Deputy City Clerk Kevin Christian, will you please call roll? Commissioner Hopkins. Present. Commissioner Kahn. Here. Commissioner Quincy. Here. Commissioner Shoresman. Here. Commissioner Wolken. Here. Vice Chair Jorgensen. Having technical problems. Chair Dondekar. Yeah. Thank you. Let the record reflect that the commissioners are present through teleconferencing. I'd like to remind my fellow commissioners and staff to help us reduce background noise by muting your phone or microphone unless you're speaking. Uh, the first item on our agenda today are the minutes of the Planning Commission meeting of June 24th, 2020. If anybody has comments on the minutes before us, please unmute your microphone and identify yourselves. Seeing no unmuted microphones, do I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes? This I'll is Ms. Shoshorsman. I'll approve them. I'll move to approve the minutes. So Commissioner Horsman uh, makes a motion to approve, seconded by Commissioner Quincy. Thank you. We'll Will the Deputy City Clerk please call the roll of the motion? Commissioner Shoresman? Yes. Commissioner Quincy? Yes. Commissioner Hopkins? Yes. Commissioner Kahn? Yes. Commissioner Wolken? Yes. Chair Dondekar? Yes. Motion uh, passed. Motion passes. At this time, we will hear any public comment for items not on today's agenda. Items raised are generally referred to staff, and if action by the Commission is necessary, they may be scheduled for a future meeting. As you can see on the screen, participants of the webinar may submit a question containing their name, and the item number they wish to speak on. Once public comments for the item is opened, your microphone will be unmuted and you'll have three minutes to speak. Deputy City Clerk, do we have any public comments on items not on the agenda today? We have no comments on items not on the agenda. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Any court challenge to the actions taken on public hearing items on this agenda may be limited to considering only those issues raised at the public hearing or in written correspondence delivered to the City of San Luis Obispo at or prior to the public hearing. If you wish to speak, please give your name and address for the record. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Consultant and project presentations are limited to six minutes. We will proceed to the second item on the agenda. The public hearing item before us is to review a project located at 1144 Charo Street. Uh, the item involves some 30,000 square feet of commercial office space, 50 residential dwelling units within the downtown historic district. It includes a rezone to provide a plan, planned development overlay, a PDO, and demolish, demolishing of existing structures, a request for a floor area ratio of 4.0, and preservation permanently of buildings off-site. Uh, buildings located on Monterey Street. Uh, 
Associate Planner Kyle Bell will present, will you please present the report? Pardon me, this is um, Attorney Marky Jorgensen. Is Vice Chair Jorgensen present yet? No, I don't see him. Because this is a quasi-judicial um, hearing or, you know, item, it might be in our best interest to wait until Vice Chair Jorgensen is present to begin this presentation, because if we begin while he's not here, um, there might be due process concerns that we would have to start over if he wanted to participate in that decision. This is Deputy Clerk Christian. I will, if if the chair feels it's appropriate to uh, call a short recess, I'll, I'll try raising uh, Commissioner Jorgensen on the phone and see if we can get him to join in. Um, actually, his 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 microphone just went green. Uh, Vice Chair Jorgensen, are you able to hear and speak right now? It went red. As I was saying, I will try to give him a, a phone call and see if he can perhaps join in uh, just by phone if he's not able to get his technology to work. I'll call the meeting to recess for an indefinite period until we hear from the city clerk that we should reconvene. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Wilkin, are you there? I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, 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 Associate Planner Kyle Bell, can you please present the report? All right, yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, and is the screen available for viewing? Yes, it's a note. Yeah, it's not full screen. Okay, thank you for reminding me. Okay, there we go. Uh, so, um, to introduce, to introduce myself, my, my name is Kyle Bell. I'm associate planner with the City of San Luis Obispo's Planning Department. I'm actually joined here today as well by um, city staff uh, Luke Schwartz from our transportation division, as well as uh, Corey Burnett from utilities. Uh, we also have Paula Carr, which is our the architectural historian who worked on the architectural historian report, as well as Emily Creel, who is who was working with us as a consultant for the environmental uh, determination. And so I'm going to dive right into it. So I can get these slides to go through. So tonight's recommendation is for the Planning Commission to um, make a recommendation to City Council to uh, approve the development plan and plan development overlay uh, regarding the rezone and adoption of the mitigated negative declaration for environmental review based on the findings and subject to conditions and mitigation measures outlined in the draft resolution and draft ordinance. There we go. The project site is located at the corner of Mor uh, Marsh and Choro Streets within the downtown commercial zone along the boundary of the downtown historic district. The development project is adjacent to a masterless historic resource known as the Weinman Hotel and is directly across the street from the, the Marsh Street parking garage. The overlay is identified on the screen that includes the development site as well as the downtown center um, and as well as adjacent properties across the street from uh, along Morrow and, and Hungara Streets. These, uh, these properties um, within the um, PD overlay are all owned by the applicant team. The project consists of a six story um, development comprised of ground floor commercial, two stories of office uses, and three levels of uh, residential, providing 50 residential units. The project also includes a plan development overlay rezoning application intended to transfer density from properties with, like the downtown center to the project site. Um, the project also includes a request to allow a maximum height of 75 feet or normally allowed for 50 feet within the downtown commercial zone. The 
The project was previously reviewed by the ARC and CHC back in 2018 as a conceptual project. Each commission provided several directional items for consideration by the applicant and staff to be incorporated into the formal application. A city council initiation was also required by staff to verify the process forward in consideration of the applicant's proposed feature, uh, mandatory project features and community benefits proposed for the PD overlay and the maximum height of the application. The council supported the proposed mandatory project features and community benefits with only minor amendments. As shown on the screen, this was the original concept drawing of the, the project. The applicant responded to the ARC and CHC directional items and incorporated modifications to the project design to what we see today. The applicant's presentation will provide further clarification on the design modifications in response to the ARC and CHC direction. On June 1st, the ARC reviewed the modified design of the project and identified several comments and recommendations for further consideration by the Planning Commission. The expectation this evening is to identify the Planning Commission's concurrence um, on, these, on these comments to be incorporated into the final, re uh, final resolution as conditions of approval. And we can refer back to these during discussion. On June 22nd, the CHC also reviewed the modified design and then identified a comment for further consideration for the Planning Commission. It is staff's intentions to also seek uh, direction from the Planning Commission on how to incorporate uh, their comment into the final resolution of the project as well. The plan development overlay requires inclusion of three, um, three of the four mandatory project features outlined in the zoning regulations. The applicant's application identifies that they intend to meet these mandatory project features by providing 25% um, of the residential units dedicated for moderate income households as well as designing the project to meet uh, the LEED um, silver rating certification for energy efficiency and by permanently preserving the downtown center as a public amenity for our community. For projects that request a maximum building height above 50 feet in the downtown zone, require that they incorporate community benefits into the project proposal for structures uh, for structures that exceed 75 feet in height, or up to 75 feet in height, three community benefits are required. The applicant's application identifies that they intend to meet the, the benefits by providing a project that exceeds the 36 density units per acre threshold with an average unit size of 1,000 square feet. And this is intended to meet the workforce housing uh, community benefit. The applicant is also requesting to use the pedestrian amenity benefits by providing the permanent preservation of the downtown center as a public amenity. This benefit is also used for, to satisfy the mandatory project feature as previously mentioned, uh, which was supported by city council at the uh, original project initiation last September. Uh, and also in response to the council direction, the applicant has incorporated uh, the, the third community benefit as a mode shift by providing a permanent shift of uh, permanent shift of uh, transportation for the project away from vehicle uh, transportation by incorporating a transportation demand management plan, which was included in the staff report materials. The project also includes a request to increase the floor area ratio for the project from 3.75 to four. A quick refresher on the floor area ratio, uh, which is also known as FAR. Uh, this is defined as the net area of a building on a lot divided by the area of the lot. Uh, so you can see some examples in the bottom right hand corner of uh, how FARs are applied to uh, development projects. A request to increase the FAR in the downtown zone is allowed in conjunction with the historic preservation. The applicant has proposed the permanent preservation of an off-site historic resource uh, which, uh, on a property which they own, uh, known as the Museo Building on Monterey Street. Uh, also, a quick overview of the proposed density of the project. The intentions of the overlay is for the purposes of transferring density um, between the properties within the overlay to the subject site. Uh, the area within the overlay provides for 77.76 density units, whereas the project is only um, utilizing 26.5 density units. So there would still be remaining 51.26 density units for future development within the plan development overlay. 
No additional development is proposed at this time within the downtown center or any adjacent properties. Project also includes a um, mitigated negative declaration, which identifies potential effects to the following environmental factors, air quality, uh, biological resources, cultural resources, hazards and hazardous materials, noise, transportation, tribal cultural resources, and utility and, and service systems. Uh, each of these uh, sections have identified uh, mitigation measures at which to reduce the thresholds uh, to less than significant for each of these categories. Uh, specifically regarding uh, cultural and uh, tribal cultural resources sections, um, the, we have a historic context statement, I'm sorry, a historic context report and a architectural evaluation report from Paula Carr from SWCA, which identified that the project would have less than a significant impact on adjacent historic resources and that the existing structure does not qualify as a historic resource under the, the city's listing criteria. Furthermore, we've identified mitigation measures to address um, construction um, practices with, on the property within the downtown zone and historic district to make sure that any um, excavation or uh, movement of soil would identify any um, resources and proper procedures on how to address that if that were to occur. And that actually concludes the staff's presentation and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna call upon uh, planning, planning commission members in alphabetic order for questions and comments. Uh, Commissioner Hopkins. Yeah, so I wanted to see, Kyle, if you could go into uh, a little bit more about the, the FAR and how the applicant is meeting, um, essentially meeting that exemption through pro providing the offsite historical preservation. Have we done, um, have we met that requirement or allowed that exemption in the past in this way before? It, it just, I guess that's that's one of my, uh, my sticking points here. No, absolutely. We actually have zero examples of this being uh, occurring before. Uh, we have not seen a project be approved uh, above 50 feet within the downtown commercial zone, except for the um, San Luis Square, which didn't uh, require an ex uh, to exceed the floor area ratio limitations. So we have not seen uh, any project utilize this uh, provision in code uh, in the past. And so this would be a first. Okay, thank you. That's it for my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jorgensen. mute myself um just uh, i just want to confirm that the um the i'm thinking of the transportation side of this and particularly the parking site given that there's only seven spaces on site that the um downtown um uh, what was it called downtown overnight parking program is still in existence and could be applicable to this uh, project it looks like there's something on the order of 50 spaces uh, kind of designated for that kind of um, overnight parking on the third and fourth floor of the parking structure across the street. But I just wanted confirmation that that would be available. Yes, that would still be available for these residences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Khan. Uh, we can't hear you, Commissioner Khan. Can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Um, I would like to hear more about the uh, residential units and how they work. Probably the applicant will cover that in his presentation, but how the community kitchen works and how these rooms work and can people go out on the decking area. And so just some details on how the whole residential thing works and how they also in the car sharing, how you request a car and how you get a car. And so how it how the whole residential uh, operation functions. Absolutely. The applicant will be uh, able to touch on more details on that than myself. But uh, one thing to note is that this uh, applicant team is the same applicants as the uh, Monterey Street redevelopment plan, which does include 30 residential units uh, along Monterey Street. And those, that project does not include any parking on site. So they actually have experience and practice of uh, providing residential units downtown uh, through effective programs to reduce parking demand. So I'll let the applicant uh, touch on that in more detail uh, during your presentation or after. Thank you. Commissioner Quincy. Thank you. I have a couple of questions, Kyle. Uh, first, 
by reserving the uh, the 13 units for moderate income, does that give them any kind of density bonus uh, through the city? Does that, does that does that happen with this project? Uh, they they could uh, they could incorporate a density bonus, uh, but it would be pretty minimal for moderate. Um, uh, for example, the this project, if it was not to include a, a plan development overlay, would require a about a ninety percent density bonus. Uh, and for moderate income units, that would require about ninety five percent of all the units to be deed restricted to affordable units. Uh, and for obvious reasons, the applicant team was not interested in pursuing that option in light of the opportunity they had with the PD overlay. Okay, uh, that kind of answers my question then, because I was trying to get at the height issue. I was wondering, so really the only way we get to that, uh, to allow for that height is through those three community benefits thing that it was described in the staff report, is that right? Correct, so the, the zoning regulations outline opportunity to exceed the 50 foot um, maximum height in the downtown zone by incorporation of those community benefits. And so it is up to the commission and city council ultimately for identifying how these community benefits are implemented. And so we, went to, we did a council initiation back in September to kind of weigh the options of how this project was moving forward in consideration of those features. Uh, and so we, were, we, got, we have uh, general support from the city council on the path forward regarding those, uh, but we are certainly open for uh, discussion. I noticed that one of them was the preservation of the Paseo. I was kind of confused at what what aspect of that downtown center the Paseo is? Uh, so the downtown center, um, I guess you have to kind of look back at the original development of the downtown center as a project in itself. Uh, and then if you identify that the downtown center as a pedestrian Paseo was not a requirement of the development, but a project feature that was incorporated into the project by the applicant team at that time, uh, mm -hmm. you can by that the downtown center does not have any permanent protections in place for its uh, preservation of use by the public. And so while it would be difficult for the applicant team to just abolish that uh, ability, um, we, and we wouldn't support that e either, but we want to make sure that we lock in the permanent and um, opportunity for the public access uh, in light of the downtown uh, center as being a feature of our downtown community. I, th I think you kind of nailed the question I had. It just like, you know, did does the city have any indication that there would not be a preservation of the Paseo, I guess is what I'm getting at. No, the applicant team has never proposed any uh, any changes to that or they're not asking for any modifications to that ability. It's simply just kind of recordation of, um, of how it's been used and it's uh, uh, in perpetuity. And then the third community benefit was the modal split. Was that what you were talking about with Commissioner Jorgensen? Then I suppose is like the shift to, uh, I guess I mean there's a you know there's a significant lack of parking here. Is that is that kind of what that means? Yeah. So we actually um, we went into quite a lot of discussions regarding parking on this site. Um, the original concept plan did include more than ten parking spaces on site through a new driveway access. And unfortunately, under our provisions of new driveways within the downtown, any new driveway access that provides parking to more than 10 uh, parking stalls is required to be uh, dedicated for public access. And so the, um, the applicant was not interested in dedicating the, the minimal parking they were trying to provide for public access. So they had to reduce the amount of parking below 10 spaces to, um, to meet the, the requirement of the, the limitations of new driveways in downtown. So that was a very curious limitation that we kind of happened upon uh, during the project proposal. And so uh, during that time, we uh, were able to then work with the applicant team on addressing how to prioritize alternative modes of transportation rather than um, focusing on vehicle traffic. I could uh, jump in here, Kyle and, and Commissioner Quincy. I just wanted to add a little bit more information on the Paseo, because um, that was, you know, definitely something that was uh, discussed early on during the initiation uh, of the application. And um, Kyle's right; we don't have any indication today that uh, the the property owner would want to do anything different with the Paseo than than how we see it right now. But we, when you look at the long term, and you look at uh, pedestrian path of travel and also how, how uses have changed over time downtown. There are no protections in place and, and retail is certainly uh, changing. Um, so the permanent preservation of that Paseo 
relative to the location of the Marsh Street parking structure, and then a, a desire to have a Paseo uh, also be mid-block between Higuera and Monterey. You know, right now it's frequently used through the Ross building or, or through <clears throat> Betty's Fabrics. <clears throat> At some point in the future, we could see uh, redevelopment that would enable an additional Paseo on that block. And uh, that's something where with permanent protection of the downtown center Paseo, then you have really good connectivity between the Marsh Street parking structure and Monterey Street with um, all of the, the features there. So it is something that we're looking to as part of long-term uh, pedestrian path of travel downtown. And this is something that, you know, uses ch have changed downtown over the years. When you look at <clears throat> 100 years of uses downtown where we used to have over 5% over of the whole city population lived in the downtown core, at some mm -hmm. point, uh, most of that residential was converted to offices and that's the economy will drive that and the city won't really be able to uh, say anything different if we don't have these kinds of protections in place so it is it is a, a feature that there is a an interest in uh, preserving even though it exists in in the form uh, that it is today uh and if, if i could keep the questions rolling i'm sorry i have a bunch of them but um the, I had another question on the parking issue, and Michael, thank you for explaining that. Um, that that definitely makes sense to me. Um, I had a question on the parking. Is there a cap on paying in uh, on a certain number of spots that a developer can pay in lieu fees on, or is it unlimited? It is unlimited. So, um, and uh, to also continue with my conversation earlier about the new driveways, uh, it. Uh, to be clear about the new driveways limitations in the zoning regulations, um, new driveways are discouraged. Uh, so the uh, idea of providing new driveways is not um, is not a feature we like to pursue in our downtown because it interrupts the pedestrian flow of traffic along the sidewalk. And so uh, we we took a great consideration of uh, this new driveway and in, in consideration of those uh, limitations. Um, and then as for any cap on um, herd parking loop fees, there hasn't been. Uh, the parking loop fee ordinance has been around since the 1960s, and we have a we have a lot of background on that ordinance itself. And I'm happy to explain it's how it's been used and and all that. If, if there's additional questions, I was I was just curious because it just seemed like a lot, you know, a large amount of spots that we're paying in lieu, and I was just curious if there was a cap. Um, One thing to clarify oh, um, to uh, regarding the actual payment of the in lieu fees. Um, the way parking and loofies work is that there is a, a credit for the existing development that's being demolished. And so the existing park, the existing parking demand for the, um, the Riley's building uh, is uh, is 49 spaces. And so we credit for that because they would be only paying for the increased demand in our downtown, uh, which is going to result in 39 spaces, which is outlined in the staff report. Yep, cool. Uh, and then the museo, the what uh, Commissioner Hopkins was talking about, is so. Is there some? So we talked about it being historically significant. Um, would they be able to do anything to that site, anyways, in the future? I mean, isn't? So I, I'm just curious because I know that we're giving them credit for that for the um, for the for the floor area ratio. But I was wondering, in the future, would they? I mean, would they be able to do anything to that because it is a historical site? Potentially. Uh, so there's a lot of ands, ifs, or buts uh, regarding what could have happened with this site. Uh, but in essence, what occur, what's being requested right now is a permanent preservation of this structure. And so uh, that would eliminate any future questions within 50 years or 100 years from now on whether or not that project site could be delisted or redeveloped or et cetera. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. I appreciate it. Thank you for the questions. Uh, Commissioner Schwarzman. Yeah, I've got two questions, Kyle. Um, the first one, just I guess a clarification, I didn't gather it until just now when you were talking through your report, but it sounds like the preservation of the downtown center is sort of being used twice, for lack of a better term, um, so that it can count towards the the density of the building as well as one of the um, components for the um, 
the, the community benefit for, I'm, I'm losing my words here, but it's being used twice as one of the, the community benefits and then also for the density. Yes, absolutely. And that was actually one of the things that we were concerned about as well, that we, and one of the reasons why we went to the city council so early in this process to get confirmation on whether or not the applicant team could use uh, the same feature for both a mandatory project feature as well as a community benefit. And the council was in agreement that the applicant team could move forward with that and that there was no limitations in code that would prevent them from asking for that. Okay. And then the second question um, is related to some public comment that we got and also to explain further to those who might not know the, the process for determining which units will be deemed affordable in the building. You and I talked about that um, earlier and I thought you gave a really um, clear explanation of how that process works because it was a concern of mine as well. Maybe you could explain that. Absolutely. Uh, so we actually uh, go through this process quite a lot with uh, dedicating which units become affordable um, or are provided for affordable housing. And this process called uh, that we um, review together with applicant teams through the um, affordable housing agreement process. And so through that process, we work with applicant team at identifying that the which units are dedicated for affordability. Um, and we like and part of the policies and programs in place encourage or strongly encourage that we provide a comparable mix of affordable units. And so the city would not be in agreement to allowing a, uh, a dedication of affordable housing for all the smallest units of, of a, um, a project, for instance. We'd like to see that if there's a certain number of two bedrooms, certain number of one bedrooms, certain number of studios, that a, a mix of types of units are provided for each, for the affordable housing as well as the market rate. And that Thank agreed that that is what they intend to do as well. And um, that's all my questions for now. Thank you. Commissioner Wilkin. Uh, thank you. Um, I also had the same question as Commissioner Quincy did about the Paseo or the Plaza um, in the downtown center. And I'll just throw out a rhetorical question. I don't uh, expect an answer, but that is because the uh, the Plaza has been in use for so many years continuously and uh, without any uh, attempt to obstruct it, uh, wouldn't the public have a right to assert a prescriptive a prescriptive right to continue using that? But um, that's just, I'll just throw that out there. My, my question is about um, the density transfer, and thank you, Kyle, for uh, explaining that to me earlier. Um, but um, I, I'll pose the question, uh, what is there that assures that the transfer density from the downtown center to um, this site um, won't be uh, used elsewhere in the future. Is this something that just staff keeps track of or is it something that can be memorialized somewhere in a condition or in a finding or in an ordinance? Absolutely. Uh, so the uh, uh, this is a com pretty common practice in plan development, plan development overlays across the citywide. And so when we have a, a project being proposed with a plan development overlay and future uh, modifications are made to it over time uh, down the road, uh, the city does track how much density is allocated for the different uses. Uh, one of the things to note is that if density is increased in the future, then so would the allowances of the plan development overlay. And so plan development overlay does not restrict density to the threshold of today, but would identify the ability to transfer density between property lines. And that's really really the, the, um, the summary of the intent of this plan development overlay is just this, the simple transfer of density between property lines. Uh, the 77.76 threshold would be the density allowance for any development within the boundaries of the overlay at this time. Uh, and, this, and the project would not be able to exceed that. Okay, um, thank you. I'll probably have more to say about that later, but since we're in the question phase here, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. That's all the questions. I have one. I this is Tyler. Just to quickly clarify, the the term transfer of density, that's probably not the right term to use. What it is, is it's actually uh, looking at density as it's calculated over the uh, area of the overlay for the PD. So it's not taking density from one property and giving it to another. It's calculating the entire density allowed in the overlay established through the ordinance. Right, For so for example, you could uh, identify, you could 
consider the plan development overlay as one large parcel rather than uh, several different properties in the terms of development, development potential. Okay, uh, thank you, that helps. Uh, I just, I still think uh, it should be stated somewhere, but we can talk about that later. Uh, I really, most of my questions were asked, but um, Kyle, can you remind us when was the last time in the downtown that we used a plan development overlay? Uh, we what? have. <laughs> so the the last the last time this was considered was um, actually just north of Santa Rosa. It was a plan development overlay uh, proposed as con as a conceptual project um, right there where the it used to be a Shell gas station was, and now I believe it's Bank of America. Uh, so that was the last time a plan development overlay was considered in, within the downtown core. However, that property was not part of the downtown zone, and so it didn't have the same opportunities as uh, as our, our CD zoning allows. And so uh, it was kind of a, a mix of trying to incorporate the downtown zone development potential in that upper um, downtown core area. With a very similar configuration, as I recall, with residential above recessed correct uh i i don't know yes i believe there was a there was multiple components of that project where you incorporated like a parking garage a hotel residences offices yeah, it had a whole number of uh components to it but that project is long gone now thank you um and just more recently there was uh, one other project that the planning commission saw for a, a pd amendment which was the haslow headquarters uh, off of high street yeah that was also a planned development. Mm -hmm. And actually for that project, uh, density was transferred to the residential portion of that project. So very similar circumstances for the intentions of that PD versus this one. Thank you. Uh, since there are no more questions, uh, may we have the applicant uh, presentation? Okay. Bear with me as I switch the presentations. Kyle, can you uh, remind me uh, which attendees are your applicants so that I can turn their mics on? Uh, yes, that would be um, Mark Rawson and Jim Duffy. All right, both uh, Mr. Rawson and Mr. Duffy, I have turned your microphones on, so you are self-muted still, Mr. Duffy. Great, thank you. Good evening, Commissioner Dandekar and members of the Planning Commission. I am Mark Rawson. I'm with Copeland's Properties and I'm excited to be here tonight virtually to present this latest project of ours. And as mentioned, Jim Duffy is here as well with us virtually and we are happy to be able to discuss any of the components of the project. Um, I know that I've got a limited time frame, so I'll try to be brief with my presentation. And I know Kyle has covered a lot of the points that we've also outlined in here. And so really stepping back, fundamentally, we've had this property for over six years now as a vacant property and knew that there was certainly something that could happen here. And so we took a real, you know, real good look at what can be done with this property that would meet a number of city goals as well as our own project goals. And so specifically those, as mentioned, are focusing on housing. And in particular, you know, we've got workforce housing and affordable housing that will be for rent type housing in the project, as well as a focus on sustainable transportation and trying to create density downtown because we believe that that's what we really need in order to support viable public transportation as well as to encourage bicycle and pedestrian and different types of transportation and move ourselves away from a car-centric type of development, which is how we see the future. In addition to that, we've got climate action, which we're strong supporters of. The Monterey Street project that we developed and just completed a couple of years ago is one of the first retail commercial projects in San Luis Obispo that is LEED certified. We're now in the process of completing LEED certification for Hotel San Luis Obispo. And so we are also committed to 
a LEED certification, silver rated at a minimum for this project, and as well as downtown vitality, which certainly is something that helps support not only the economy of the downtown, the city economy, but supports you know everything throughout the downtown, our projects as well as other projects by having more people downtown, which support the businesses, which you know ultimately creates a vital and a, and a vibrant downtown. So with that as our uh, fundamental goals, we've got the mandatory features that Kyle has already mentioned as well that we needed to provide in conjunction with the PD overlay, which allowed us to be creative in how we can um, how we can create a density of housing here that can be sustainable. Those mandatory features, of course, include the plaza, the LEED Silver Certification, the affordable housing that's been discussed, as well as the community benefit policies that we have uh, in conjunction with our request for the 75 foot height, allowing us to create these 50 units within this parcel size. So with the historic preservation of the Museo building, I just wanted to touch on that slightly. I know that that property, it is a centerpiece of the Monterey Street project right now, but there is no historic preservation ordinance or historic preservation, I mean, on that particular property. It's something that, you know, as Kyle mentioned, will guarantee and preserve this property for the future and for, you know, for in perpetuity. We can go to the next slide, please. This is a quick uh, summary of where we've been with the project. It was over a year and a half ago that we were first starting through the ARC and CHC process. And since that time, we've got a great amount of feedback. We've gone through the environmental review prepared a number of different reports and ultimately reshaped the project into something that you can see on the right, which we think is much improved from the initial outset and has responded very well to all of the feedback that we've gotten in the past through the various reviews that we've got. Um, if we could move to the next slide, please. I know I'm on a limited time slot here, so I'll try to keep moving. But on the left here, we've got the Choro Street view of the project. And some of the particular things that we did after the initial ARC and CHC review, you know, some of the main comments were reducing the mass and bulk of the project and particularly the upper floors, trying to create more pedestrian focused and, and areas around the project for seating and so forth. So one of the things that we did is we took a much greater setback to those upper floors to increase the amount of, uh, or actually decrease the mass, but we increased the step backs from the street facades of the building to lessen that upper mass. And you can see that you know, very clearly on the corner view. The one on the left, the view there, we actually dropped the fourth floor of the building from the entire perimeter of the facades as well uh, to give the building a three-story street-facing facade. In the prior proposed project, we had a four-story element at the street, and that was something that uh, was discussed in some of the prior reviews. So we did drop it to three stories around the perimeter. This also allowed us to concentrate the residential into a tighter mass on the upper three floors since they are all now residential on the upper levels. And with that great setback that we've established around the perimeter of the residential area, we've been able to incorporate terraces and outdoor spaces for all of the units. You can move to the next slide, please. Here's a view from the Marsh Street area of the proper of the mid block on Marsh Street, looking back towards Choro, towards the corner. And one of the significant things that was discussed was to enhance that corner by clipping it and, and providing an angled facade at the corner of Marsh and Choro, which reduces the facade of the building greatly along Marsh Street 
and lessens the scale as well. Um, the upper floors, you can see here clearly how we've stepped in the corners, articulated the building with uh, a variety of window fenestration and sizes and incorporated balconies so that all of the units have some outdoor space that is available, either a terrace or a balcony. Next slide, please. And this plan view shows the dark green area being the footprint of the building with the setbacks that were stepped back from the property line, 12 and a half feet at the Marsh Street frontage, nine feet on the Choro Street frontage, so that we've created the light green shaded areas, as you can see, are now incorporated into widened sidewalks, outdoor seating areas, entries for the residential courtyard. So a, a much, uh, you know, much greater sidewalk and open feeling around the base of the building at the footprint. The white area is the upper floors that are the three residential levels. And again, those are set back more than 20 feet from both property lines and uh, exceed the minimum requirements that we had shown in our previous proposal. It was about nine or six to nine feet on those facades. So the much improved setback of those upper floors has not only reduced that mass of the building at those upper levels, but also provided the terraces that you can see in the rendering. So. Uh, and then finally, I think we have one more slide after this that shows some of the details around the perimeter of the building at the sidewalk level along Choro Street on the left, showing areas for patio dining and the increased width of sidewalks that improve that pedestrian experience. This corner of Marsh and Choro in the center that provides a gateway and an enhanced design feature at the corner of the property. And then a, another view along the Choro Street facade showing the entry to the residential area, uh, the residential courtyard area, which serves the upper levels and has incorporated um, you know, some decorative architectural detailing into screens and facades and is carried through in some of the railings and other architectural elements around the building. So with that, I will close. I think we've got a project here that you know, we like to think of this as being something that is thinking ahead of or, or at least moving into where we believe that the future needs to go and where we need to, how we need to look at providing a greater density in the downtown so that we can, as we mentioned, support some of the things that will allow us to have a, a vital and vibrant downtown economy. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I know uh, you had mentioned a few things in your questions to Kyle, so I'm certainly happy to expand on any of those if you would like to discuss them further. Thank you, Mr. Rawson. Um, I'm going to call upon commissioners uh, alphabetically to for questions to the applicant, uh, Commissioner Hopkins. Hi, I wanted to hear more from the applicant about um, the alternative transportation component and how we can ex or how you can expect this to cause uh, the modal shift that's often cited in the staff report and was discussed at the city council meeting. Sure. Well, I mean, I think that the modal shift, the idea here is to try to get away from, uh, you know, cars as a fundamental need for, a, you know, for the project. And so by focusing living and working in the same area in downtown, this will enable people to, to potentially live without having to have a car. Uh, the car sharing is specifically intended to enable that so that you wouldn't need a car specifically when there is the ability to use a car when you need to. We have seven spaces in the garage that we've provided. Some of those are for drop-off, pickup, and 
there are several of them that will be available for car sharing so that you can reserve a car. There are some various, uh, you know, we've talked with some of the ride share and uh, different car sharing uh, facilitators or facilities around, you know, and in the community that have share vehicles in other locations. And they would be interested in providing share cars within this project as well so that residents can use the share cars if they need to go to the you know go shopping or have a trip planned out of town or or just want to get away from downtown but you know not only that we're close to public transit i think that bicycling is certainly something that is you know something that we see a continued growth in our downtown bicycling capabilities you know, through the expansion of our our uh, bikeways and bike lanes i myself you know i don't live downtown i work downtown and i bicycle in and out of town every day and so you know, i think that the idea of making the mode shift work is trying to create the opportunities for people to live and work where they don't need a car is that uh, does that answer your question, Commissioner Hopkins? Yeah, and I just I had a one more related question about the seven uh, spaces. Is there a um, best practice as to how you arrived at the seven space number? Is that you know is there is there any kind of uh, calculation based on the amount of units, or how did how did we, you arrive at that that number of spaces uh, for, for yeah. the car share component? Yeah, well, we felt that three to four car share spaces would be adequate for the 50 apartments that we have here. And then one space that would be an accessible space in the project for, uh, you know, an a, a accessible handicap type of space. And then we needed a couple of spaces for loading. Uh, we also were limited somewhat by the number of spaces that we can achieve in this particular garage and not exceed that number of 10 spaces that are not allowed in the downtown with driveways. So part of the reasoning is that we don't want to create another parking facility here. The city has parking facilities in close proximity and has parking available in the downtown. So to lessen the amount of cars coming in and out of the garage here, uh, we wanted to keep it just to the minimum requirements. So the right. seven spaces gives us enough for, um, you know, to provide three to four car share spaces, a couple of loading spaces and an accessible space. Okay. And, and that, so there was no, um, uh, I guess there was no obligatory formula or calculation as to how you arrived at that three to four specifically and how that compares to other properties that tend to have a car share component? Is there a no, I guess, a method to that approach? There are not a lot of uh, real hard rules that, uh, that would dictate how many, you know, in talking with some of the companies that provide car sharing, this seemed to be the, the number that was considered to be appropriate for the size of property that we have here but uh, no I'm not aware of any specific formula for it okay thank you that, that concludes my question thank you mm -hmm. thank you Commissioner Jorgensen I had a question about the uh, unit floor plans they're, they're the plans that you see on uh, a 2.6 uh, in the uh, presentation materials that you've provided um, Really, I'm kind of just wondering what kind of, in studios, there's not much space, no matter what you do. I noticed that most of the studios um, have a kitchen area with a sink and then immediately behind a bathroom. And uh, there's just something about that that just doesn't ring well to me as I think of living in a spot like that. I'm just wondering what alternatives uh, might be available that you've considered as you. Uh, I'm looking at, for instance, 504, 505, 507. Um, 
516, particularly those are those units um, where there's just a very small separation between the two uses, which seem very incompatible. I'm just wondering if there, if there are any alternatives you have considered that I had to dismiss uh, to fit everything in. I'm not concerned about the size. I think the size is going to work. I'm looking forward to seeing how this plays out. But Sure, sure. Oh, my, yeah, you know, um, there's certainly a lot of refinement that generally takes place through any project and with these units that's probably safe to say that there will be additional refinements but um, you know we're confident that through materials and design and and the way that the units are put together that they can all be made to you know to be very attractive and nice units i mean looking at 504 specifically um, the idea there would be to try and create a space where you can have somewhat of a, you know, sleeping nook separate from where your living space may be. Uh, you know, would we look at potentially sliding the bathroom over and having one large studio? Yes, we probably would. So a lot of times we try to lay out the floor plans. You know, there's so many different elements to the buildings and that's you know kind of one of those pieces that will continue to evolve and be refined and there may end up being other opportunities to fine tune some of those studio layouts and create some different unit types within the studios as well. So um, I mean I think that's a valid question whether the apartment should have both of the you know the bed nook and the and the living space contained within the same area and the bathroom shoved over to the corner i'm guessing that's you know kind of what you're thinking whether there would be a better use of a larger studio space versus the two smaller spaces with the bathroom in the middle we designed the units that are in the building over top of you know the old um, the corner of choro and Monterey, the Blackstone building that's now, it houses Lululemon on the ground floor. And above that building and above the Sour, we've got a number of units, some as small as, you know, I think the smallest unit in there is under 200 square feet. Mm -hmm. And yet we're able to still incorporate a kitchen, bathroom, and sleeping area. And the units are very attractive and they're, you know, very desirable just because of their you know, their proximity and their location downtown and they, they have each of them has a very unique character and they're all very charming in a you know unique way so i think that it's it's fair to say that there will be many continued you know looks at some of the unit layouts here as we continue to move through the project and some of those refinements may you know, may incorporate some things that aren't necessarily shown right now. Yeah, it's easy to see there's trade-offs to be, it's it's a tough uh, tough design issue in some ways, and uh, I'm glad to hear mm -hmm. you uh, thinking and we'll be continuing to think about it. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Khan. Yeah, I would like a little more information on how the uh, residential units work, uh, how you reserve a kitchen. Are there cooking facilities inside the units? It looks like there's a, a, a microwave maybe and a sink. And how you reserve a car down in the, the parking area. It's kind of how it functions. Sure. Well, as far as the kitchens, I mean, they are all very small, you know, efficiency kitchens so that you do have the ability to make food, prepare food, prepare, you know, whatever you might want within your own unit. We did provide a common area kitchen as well as sort of a larger facility if you wanted to have a group of people over or you wanted to have, you know, a, a common dinner with some of the other residents. You know, there's a variety of different ways that that common kitchen might be utilized. And so with the property management on site there would be 
a number of ways that that might be implemented. The most likely way being a sign up through a, a program that would be facilitated on a, you know, like a Google calendar or something. We've got some shared facilities in some of our other properties and office conference rooms, as well as common area spaces similar to these. And those are usually managed through some type of a online sign up calendar on a, like a Google calendar. And the car share would be a similar type of thing that would be managed by a company that actually their specialty or their, you know, their focus is on the car sharing. So in exchange for us providing the spaces for the car share, they provide the car, the insurance, all of the logistics of making the car share car available so that there again, you register for the car and you go down and it has a, uh, a keypad on the door, you punch in the numbers and open it up and car is yours for whatever time you reserved it for. Very good. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Thank you. Was there any plan to not preserve the Pasteo? Well, there's never been a plan to not preserve it, but there's no guarantee that it would have to remain in perpetuity. So for example, it might not even be in our you know, immediate time frame, but if 20 years or 10 years from now, somebody wanted to enclose that space and turn it into an indoor mall of some type or convert the whole space to a different use, there's nothing that would preclude that. Obviously it would have to go through you know, review by the city and the various agencies, but there is no specific requirement to keep that plaza open through there. This would guarantee, as Michael had stated earlier, that that plaza and that paseo through there would remain in perpetuity as a pedestrian space. Okay. Uh, and then my other question was about the energy efficiency. I'm admittedly not an expert in that. I don't really quite understand it that well, to be honest. But um, would a, you know, based on your development experience, would a new development ever not, like in 2020, ever not be the lead silver rating? Or is that really a premier rating? Lead silver is above the minimum rating. The minimum rating is just lead certification. And then there's silver, gold, and platinum, which are each tougher to achieve. And yes, in California, we have a lot of strict energy requirements already, but you don't always achieve lead certification just by meeting the minimum requirements of California's Title 24 energy requirements. So LEED certification goes a little bit beyond just energy compliance. It also involves using sustainable materials, incorporating things that are not just energy efficiency uh, focused, but also things that are you know, sustainable from the standpoint of utilizing materials and things that don't come from non-sustainable sources. You know, we're, you're not cutting down rainforest trees because you're using certified sustainably uh, grown lumber and you know there's a whole host of things using paints and different products that are <clears throat> non uh, voc non you know they don't off gas volatile organic compounds so there's a lot of things that are not necessarily just energy requirements that are involved in achieving lead certification. So I, I guess that's probably the, the biggest uh, you know, component in my answer there is that it's lead involves more than just being an energy efficient building. Okay, Th thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Schwarzman. Hi, yes, my questions are about mode share, or I mean mode shift and um, the transportation um, requirements, the transportation demand management program. And you talked a little bit about the car share mm -hmm. uh, and the parking spots that you've set aside in the building for that. 
Uh, are there other elements besides just encouraging you know people to live where they work uh, and the the car sharing idea that you'll be incorporating um, for that community benefit? Yes, in fact, uh, we submitted a transportation management and parking reduction plan to the city as a preliminary outline, and it includes such items as uh, you know, ways that we would promote, you know, not only the car sharing, but there would be ways to promote the residents as well as the occupants. You know, here's the uh, parking demand reduction management plan, but to encourage uh, car sharing as well as carpooling and different modes of getting to and from the office component of the, you know, or the commercial spaces within the building. There will be showers and lockers and things available that would enable bicycling or other types of commuting to the property for, you know, for the occupants of the building. And then there will be information available that will be distributed to the tenants as well as the occupants, the tenants of the commercial buildings as well as the occupants. We typically would have somebody appointed as the manager of the transportation uh, demand reduction plan, and they would periodically talk with the retail tenants as well as the office tenants to keep uh, you know keep track and and to monitor how they are doing as far as incorporating some of the programs and making sure that that information is available to the different tenants within the building. Um, some of the other things that are encouraged are the ability to use public transit and ways and means to get that information to people. There's a lot of people that aren't even aware of some of the uh, public transit opportunities in the downtown that are available to. For example, if you're a, if you work in the downtown, you're able to get a bus pass at a reduced rate or sometimes at no cost. And so getting that information out to the occupants of the building and the, both the tenants and the commercial occupants is part of what happens through that traffic uh, parking and demand reduction plan. Uh, would there, would the, the car sharing be available to just the residents of the building or would they, would that be available to people working in the, uh, in the businesses that are located oh, yeah. in the building as well? Yes, it would be available to the retail as well as the office tenants, anybody within the building. In fact, it would be available potentially for other folks that are in the downtown to use as well. Oh, so they would be available to the public by using some sort of app or something? I, I believe so, yes. I mean, I know a lot of the car sharing companies that we've talked with, they do have a, a you know, you sign up for the program and then they have vehicles that are distributed throughout the downtown and throughout the community. And anybody that is registered into their program can use any of the vehicles that are part of their car sharing facility. Right. So even if you lived here and you were registered for the car sharing, you could use vehicles that are located in other spaces throughout the downtown too. Right, Zipcar I think is one of those or? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. um, also, was there was there any consideration given to just not having any parking at all in the building, uh, and maybe just allowing for, uh, you know, a handicap parking spot um, and sort of a, maybe a pull up area along the street so that um, Uber and Lyft and some of those other types of ride sharing. Um, systems could be used and not have to provide that driveway, which sort of interferes with pedestrian traffic. Um, you know, we we didn't really look at ever eliminating all of the parking. We felt that, you know, just from the standpoint of somebody arriving and wanting to get their furniture offloaded and different things, we have the ability to enter into the garage and then there is an elevator there that accesses the residential level as well as, you know, there's an elevator for each of the residential lobby as well as the office lobby. Each has a private 
elevator of their own. And then there's an elevator that would be more of what you might consider the freight elevator in the garage that would access all levels so that office tenants and or residential tenants would have the ability to move furniture, move products or goods or supplies and different things to the different levels. So we felt that this was a good utilization of some of the space on site and that it would be it would be more challenging to not have any parking spaces available on site and then the ability to have some drop off delivery and car sharing seemed to be a seemed to be something that really made the project made, made it more functional and so for that reason i guess you know we never really looked at completely eliminating the, the parking component um i think that's all my questions thank you thank mm -hmm. you um commissioner wilkin uh, thank you uh regarding the the mode shift, just one further question on that. You were just um, referring to the parking reduction plan. Um, so I'm, I'm gathering that that is essentially the outline for the transportation demand management program that needs to be submitted to meet the um, uh, one of the community objectives. Is that essentially what it is? Yes, yes that's that's correct. Yes. Okay. Has that uh, TDM plan been prepared yet, or are you working on it? Well, I mean, we've submitted it to the city, and then now through the course of the project, uh, you know, the development review, you know, as well as construction drawings and so forth, there would be a continued refinement of that plan, working with engineering and traffic. So. I don't know that it's a final plan, but yes, that has been submitted and that's basically the plan that has been proposed right now. Okay, good, thank you. Um, I had another question about the uh, terraces for the mm -hmm. residential units. It looks like each, and I think you mentioned this, each unit on the fourth floor will have its own uh, terrace. Are those private terraces for each unit and is there some sort of separation from uh, the terrace on one unit to the adjacent unit? Yes, there is. And there's uh, those are private terraces for each unit. There is one terrace at the corner that would be common to the all of the residential tenants. And it opens off of this lounge that you see at the corner here where the cursor is hovering. There will be separation between them. It would be a low wall that would step up as it you know steps away from this facade so the parapet or the you know the top of the building wall at the street line would be approximately three and a half to four feet high and then as the parapets step back towards the units we will have it stepping up there's landscape buffers and planters that are located in between the different units in most cases to provide some additional separation between the units so that there's you know some degree of privacy from one terrace to the other okay great thank you and none of these uh, none of the terraces or the lounge terrace is not accessible to the public is that correct it is not accessible to the public. I mean, it wouldn't mean that somebody from the residential units here couldn't, you know, I mean, it's it's common, but no, I guess probably the answer to your question is it's not really intended to be a public terrace that you would go and use if you weren't one of the residents or invited by one of the residents of the property. Yeah, okay, great. And finally, this is not really an earth-shaking question, but it has to do with the, uh, the proposed trees on the uh -huh. terrace, I, I noticed that they are magnolia trees, and it says they're dwarf magnolia trees, but I just wanted to point out that the regular magnolia trees that you see in the mm -hmm. front yards of, of people's houses are um, have these huge and very heavy fruits. And so I was wondering if these dwarf trees have those same fruits, um, they might pose a hazard um, if they fall down to the sidewalk below you know i i'm not 
sure to be honest with you whether they have the same fruits. I know that uh, one of the discussion points at the CHC and or ARC hearings were the idea of maybe reducing the scale of some of the trees at those landscape terraces. So that's something that I know is a condition in one of the uh, conditions in the in your packet there with the ordinance and or the resolution and the conditions of approval to reevaluate some of the trees. So I I think we're certainly going to look at those a little more closely and are open to a, a smaller type of tree and certainly speaking with our landscape architects will bring up the question about the types of fruits or other things that some of these trees might drop because we don't want anything to become a maintenance or a nuisance in that regard okay thank you and since you pointed out that um, arc recommendation the way I read it was that the planters should be scaled down. It actually didn't refer to the trees, so I'm I'm not sure what the intent was. Maybe staff can clarify that at some point. But the way it's worded, it says uh, scale back the planters on the on the roof. So I'll just leave that for staff to address if if they uh, can later. Th those are all the questions I had. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we just have one quick question on the second and third floor. Uh, is that an open office floor plan or is just office space and it will get divided up as you it's, get to Sure. I mean, it, it would depend on the ultimate user. So it is currently shown as just a large open space. It's more than likely that it will be broken up into various sizes. We would like to think that it would provide opportunities for larger type office uses so that you know we might see some of the bigger office type tenants locate into the downtown some of the types of tenants that couldn't currently uh, find space in the downtown because there's not large footprint office space available downtown most everything downtown is smaller and more cut up but um, no it's intended that this will be available and could likely be broken up into any number of smaller suites for different office sizes. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, thank you very much. So I would like to ask the Deputy City Clerk if we have any public comments on this item beyond what we were sent uh, prior to the meeting. Yes, we do. Uh, hold on one moment and we'll call. Uh, I have Mr. Alan Cooper who has sent in a note. Just one moment, Mr. Cooper, I'll turn on your mic. Mr. Cooper, your your mic is on now. You Can you be able to hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Honorable Chair, Dandekar and commissioners, my name, as you know, is Alan Cooper, and I reside in San Luis Obispo, and I'm speaking on behalf of Faber Downtown. I hope that some of you have had an opportunity to read our July 5th letter regarding this project. If you haven't, permit me to briefly summarize some of the major points made. We've discovered what we think are major errors and omissions related to this project's floor area ratio entitlement. At the very least, I would hope that you would ask staff to explain how we might be in error on these points. First, staff specifically cites land use element policy 4.2.1 and 6.4.5 to justify the transfer of development credits. But if you actually read these policies, they only apply to open space located outside the urban reserve line or development limit line. The question you should ask staff is as follows. Please cite the precise paragraph within the LUE where it states that commercial core properties may serve as receiver sites for transfer of development credits obtained from preservation of open space within the downtown core. Second, the historian, I believe, was an error when she claimed that there was no indication of any architect being associated with the Riley's department store project. The questions you should ask staff are as follows. Could William Decker Holdridge, 
presumably the architect of this project, be considered a master architect? Does this building embody the distinctive characteristics of type, period, and region? Is this building a rare survivor of the architect's work? As we know, he did design the city hall. And if any of the above is true, can we now assert that there is indeed an historic resource on the project site? Our third point has no bearing on floor area ratios, but is important, uh, we think, nevertheless. We have expressed concern that given the adverse effects of population growth and climate change, and given the compelling scientific evidence that both factors contribute to the increase in zoonotic diseases, we should plan for the probability that there may never be a post-pandemic world. Therefore, the questions you should ask yourselves are as follows. Is it not irresponsible to approve housing where future tenants must live in cramped close quarters? And is it not irresponsible to approve housing that can only be accessed via elevators, narrow corridors, and stairs where social distancing is nearly impossible? Finally, putting the pandemic issue aside, why would a moderate income household prepared to pay upwards of $2,100 per month in rent settle for a three to 500 square foot micro unit? Given the minute size of these units, shouldn't some proportion of these be offered to very low income households instead? In closing, we hope that you're all keeping safe and we wish to thank you for your service. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Are there any other comments? I see no other comments for item number two at this time. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to get the discussion, bring the discussion back to commission. Um, I, we've had an exhaustive series of questions and answers, both from staff and um, the applicant. Uh, I was wondering if it might help if we um, work around uh, uh, having a motion uh, and a second and then deliberate on the purview of the planning commission uh, and discuss those items along the purview dimension. What, how does the commission feel about that? I'm not sure I'm following what what you mean. <laughs> um, I, I thought that we got a good inkling of the kinds of issues that uh, commissioners were concerned about in the nature of their questions. And so I wondered whether it was fruitful for us to go again and summarize what some, what some of the highlights of your concerns might be or whether we might do them through a process where we adopt the motion, uh, we, we make the motion with a second and then deliberate specifically those elements that we think need to either be introduced or um, questioned in the, in the motion itself as it's laid out. So this was a strategy that we talked about at the last retreat and uh, if I could just just suggest, for instance, if there is a, a planning commissioner that's supportive of the staff recommendation, um, there could be a motion. And if there's a second or a second with some friendly amendments, then that would put a motion on the table for discussion. And then the discussion would be about your ability as a commissioner to support that motion. For instance, you might be able to support that motion if there was an additional condition of approval on an issue that you believe uh, should be further addressed in some way, or if there's a change that you would like to see. And then the discussion can kind of get around where the consensus is relative to the staff recommendation. This is Commissioner Wilkin. Uh, that sounds um, good to me, but I thought maybe before we do that, we could just briefly see if there were any additional questions for staff or if staff had any responses to uh, things that were brought up during the uh, discussion so far. And also staff requested that we address the discussion and directional items uh, from the ARC and the CHC, and, and there were four of them, I think, 
I thought maybe we could go through those briefly um, first, but um, otherwise, um, I think it's a good idea to start with a motion and then go to discussion. Kyle, do you have those items on a slide? Yes, I do. Let me give you back the control one moment. Thank you, by the way, um, uh, Mr. Codron, about the, this process. And of course, thanks. Um, so um, maybe I could get some further clarification. Would you like me to start with the responding to public comments, or would you prefer to dive right into the ARC directional items? And please turn your camera on, Kyle. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, oh, if you could address the public comment, that would be uh, appreciated. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, first of all, the uh, land use uh, element policy that was referenced as uh, 6.4.5 is related to the, the, um, the transfer of development potential from preservation of open space along the green belt of the city, uh, which is applicable to this project. Uh, the applicant's not asking for anything similar to that. Um, the, uh, the reference to that section is from policy 4.2.1 which does encourage the um, ability to transfer development potential uh, to provide for higher density housing. And so um, it's not related to open space and I'm not sure why that policy was being referenced. Um, but um, as for the historic preservation report, we do have Paula Carr, the author of the uh, architectural evaluation report um, in the meeting today. Um, but I'll, if we need additional assistance, we can, we can bring her in. But uh, to, to quickly clarify the Architect um, William Decker Hol Holbridge was not the architect of record for this structure. Uh, the section in the report that mentions uh, William was uh, in reference to a project he had provided a concept for in close proximity to this project site, uh, but was not the project site itself. Um, and so there's no direct association with um, William to this project site and that's clarified and identified in the architectural, story, uh, architectural evaluation report. Uh, furthermore, the um, provisions identified as the affordable housing thresholds and uh, costs um, as referenced in the letter that uh, Mr. Cooper had uh, identified was um, based off of a, a range of affordable housing thresholds for moderate income households. However, the actual uh, allocation or identification for thresholds are associated with the type of unit uh, and they're not at the discretion of a developer to choose within a range. And so. For a studio, there's a there's a specific number. There for one bedroom, there's a specific number, and those those ranges ranges are actually below the thresholds that are mentioned in that uh, agenda correspondence. Um, and then I believe that was uh, there were three main questions uh, that were raised. Um, but if there's something else that I missed, please let me know. Thank you. So. There is the ARC review and recommendations. Uh, Commissioner Wilkin, did you have some um, discussions on these items that you would bring to the floor? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, I think there were four items. Um, one was P PC discussion item number one. There was a ARC directional item number two. There was CHC directional item number one. and. PC discussion item number three that were outlined in the staff report. And um, I'll just say that I agree with the staff's analysis on those four issues uh, so that I, I agree that there are not significant effect, there's not a significant effect on view sheds of uh, Cerro San Luis from the project uh, area, uh, from the uh, intersections around the project. Um, <clears throat> I, I agree with the staff that um, the top three stories should not be uh, changed to a brick facade to match the lower three stories. Uh, I think the, uh, the brick stucco combination is consistent with other downtown buildings. Uh, and then I also agree with the staff about uh, the uh, preservation of the Mazio building. And uh, I think that's, 
uh, adequate to uh, bump up the floor area ratio from 3.75 to 3.94, which is really a minor increase in floor area ratio. And I think uh, getting the uh, historic building preserved is a, a good trade-off for that minor increase in the floor area ratio. Uh, the, uh, the other item was an ARC directional item number two. And I think as staff pointed out, that was not really uh, the ARC's um, citing of a community design guideline was not relevant to this project. So those are my thoughts on those directional items. So essentially, I agree with staff. Um, any other comments on this item? Uh, yes. Oh, this uh, is Commissioner Hopkins. Sorry. <laughs> this is Commissioner Hopkins. Um, I wanted to agree with Commissioner Wolken and staff's analysis of the uh, the other advisory body referral co comments and directional items. I don't see any other hands. Um, I agree uh, with the differences in the materials. Uh, Commissioner Jorgensen, did you want to say something? No. Uh, this is Commissioner Wilkin. I had just one, if I could ask staff one additional question on the transfer of density, and um, would that be okay at this point? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I understand that the PD overlay has a maximum density of 77.76 density units. Is that number arrived at by a standard density calculation for that area, just applying the maximum densities uh, to the acreage of the various properties? Or is there something else involved in that in arriving at that number of 77.76? No, that, that is correct. Uh, we identified the seven properties within the plan development overlay, identified the area of each lot, and then did a calculation to identify the density thresholds based off of the standard density allowance of downtown, which is 36 density units per acre. Okay, thank you. Are there any other discussion items that commissioners would like to raise? Discussion items in general or discussion items related to those uh, four elements that we were talking about? I think about the four elements so we can take care of those. So seeing none, I think uh, there seems to be a consensus that those review, those recommendations seem acceptable to the commission. Um, uh, so moving along, uh, do we want to think about, uh, can, is there a slide on the CHC's recommendations? Oh, that's the one, sorry. Yeah, so I think we've dealt with that too. Um, so the floor is open to commissioners if they want to raise other items generally. If nobody else has anything, I had one um, modification to propose to the draft resolution. Um, if this is a good time to do that, I'll bring that up now. Um, perhaps, uh, so perhaps we could go back to this process issue if we could uh, make the motion, second it, and then take a look at amendments. How does that sound? Yeah, I mean, just to jump in, Commissioner Shoresman, you know, you can make a motion with that modification as a as a recommendation or as a proposal as part of your motion and see if there's a second. That's an option available to any commissioner who may want to move the staff recommendation with any modifications you might want to see. Well, I'm happy to uh, make a motion to uh, get this going. I was kind of hesitating in this high level role of vice chair to uh, just avoid jumping in and taking over somehow. 
but uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and move that we uh, recommend the city council approve the development plan and plan development overlay as described in the draft resolution and draft ordinance and adopt an initial study mitigated uh, negative deck subject to the conditions of approval. And I'll second that motion. So motion made by Commissioner Jorgensen, seconded by Commissioner Kahn. Uh, and now there can be discussion on that motion and uh, Commissioner Shoresman, um, if there's a modification you would like to discuss that, you know, this would be a great time. Um, if everybody doesn't mind, then I'll chime in. Um, I wanted to propose, um, I, I, I have some concerns about the project, but I, um, but I wanted to propose in particular um, a modification of the draft resolution related to condition number 34 which is about the bike facilities, uh, the um, both the bike racks provided outside of the building exterior for the members of the public, as well as those that are using the building in the, in the bike storage area. Uh, the current uh, condition refers to uh, the ability to use inverted U design as well, or inverted U design and or peak rack designs. And I wanted to modify that resolution to allow just for peak racks. Um, for those who cycle um, and especially who have children that cycle um, or big heavy cargo bikes um, or electric bikes, um, peak racks are definitely the preferred way to lock a bike up, especially if it's heavy and doesn't have a good kickstand or um, other device to hold it up. So I would like to recommend that we modify that portion, condition number 34, uh, to specify the use of peak racks. And I'd also like to uh, recommend a modification to require installation of electric bike parking stations in the bike bicycle storage room um, so that those who, uh, as bike e-bikes become more and more popular, have a place that they can charge their bikes while they're using the building uh, and and spots that are uh, that can accommodate cargo bikes as well as those become more popular. I'm happy as the maker of the motion to accept those changes. They, they seem to uh, very much dovetail with the correspondence we got from Gary Havas. And uh, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And as a second, I agree to uh, Michelle, I appreciate your comments. I think those are thoughtful and those are great ideas. So I, I'm okay with those also. So, hey. um, commissioners, are there any other uh, recommendations, suggestions, modifications you wish to make? Uh, this is Commissioner Wilkin. I just wanted to state a few thoughts about about the project. Uh, I think it uh, the design does a good job of uh, checking all the boxes and and meeting the uh, applicable applicable policies in the land use element, uh, and also major city goals, community design guidelines, and other policies that call for affordable housing. Uh, downtown on upper stories and mixed use buildings and uh, um, walkable uh, walkable streets and so forth. Um, I did have a concern that was, I think, expressed by at least one other commissioner about you, the use of the uh, the downtown Paseo um, um, in meeting the a uh, couple of the uh, um, features to allow the plan development overlay and to allow the additional building height. Uh, since, as we know, the Paseo is already there, it's already being used, it has been used for a long time and it's already maintained. Um, however, uh, I know the city council has already weighed in on this and is in support. Uh, and also, frankly, uh, the applicant, if he chose to, could apply the uh, density bonus provisions of local and state uh, law and probably 
be successful in waiving uh, that um, feature as a requirement to gain the additional building height. So, so I don't want to make a big deal of it, but I did have a concern about uh, about use of that uh, make the public paseo. Um, it is a good thing, but I'm not sure it completely satisfies the zoning code ordinance. But again, I think there are other ways that the developer could achieve it. So I'm not going to um, make a big deal about that. Uh, I did have one uh, modification that I wanted to propose. It's on condition nine, which is on page 21. And I don't know if the uh, staff can bring that up. This is the condition that has to do with dedication of a pedestrian easement in the downtown center. Uh, and uh, in the, I'll wait a second if staff can can bring that up. If um, if not, the uh, the second sentence of that condition says that the covenant um, shall identify the responsibilities for maintenance and public access of the downtown center subject to satisfaction of the community development director. And I would just uh, recommend that it say the covenant shall identify the responsibilities for private maintenance uh, and public access of the downtown center. So to just specify that it's to be privately maintained, which I think is the intent here. Mm -hmm. And if I'm incorrect, please correct me, but. Uh, Staff, is that correct? There we go. Okay, so condition nine, the second, the second sentence is what I'm referring to. It says the covenant shall identify the responsibility for, and I would just add the word public, I'm sorry, private maintenance. <laughs> so yes. that's my suggestion on condition nine. And actually that's the only suggestion for modification that I would wish to make. Kyle, that was implied, right? Yes, it was. Uh, Commissioner Quincy, you had you wish to be recognized. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to vocalize two of the things I was kind of struggling with on this project. Uh, the first being the height. Um, I'm uncomfortable with it being 75 feet. I, I know that uh, we can consider it up to 75 feet if those three community benefits are met. Um, and I guess I should say before any of this, I'm clearly in support of, of the housing downtown. And I know that this, I'm very appreciative of this applicant for bringing this forward. And I think the city needs it. And I think we all pretty much agree on that. Um, but I am struggling with the preservation of the Paseo being a community benefit for the reasons that uh, Commissioner Wilkin uh, stated. And especially, you know, if there were, if this were to become some kind of shopping mall situation, it would be, it would come before us again. Um, and, you know, we would have the ability to essentially regulate a part of it. Um, so I'm struggling with that being termed a community benefit when it's already in existence. Um, and then the second issue I, I have, um, and I should say on that too, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Wolk and your statement on the density bonus and, and well taken, really, uh, if this were challenged, I understand that they could probably get around it. So, um, and then the second issue I'm sort of struggling with here is the parking situation. Um, I, I just feel that seven parking spots is inadequate for 50 residential units. I know the idea is to encourage people to walk. I'm very much a proponent of that. I, I make full use of that. Um, but the idea that, you know, people aren't going to have cars, I think is, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not buying that. And the idea that the people that do have cars will park in the parking structures I think we only have to look at Palm Street and Mill Street during any normal working day to see how that works out. Uh, people aren't going to pay for the parking if they have free parking on the streets. So uh, I'm just struggling with the only with with the seven spots. So I just wanted uh, uh, you all to know the two issues I was struggling with, and then uh, a thing I was thinking about. I don't even know if it's a possibility, but I, I know that the city's dealing with VRBO Airbnb issues. That was another somewhat concern I had here with these units. Is there a way we can do something in the resolution that uh, helps the city in regulating that these will not end up becoming VRBOs? Um, 
Uh, and then the other issue I thought, you know, wow, you know, with 50 residential units uh, downtown, it'd be nice to actually have a, like a, a market. Uh, you know, we don't really have a, you know, like a supermarket situation downtown. So I don't know if there's a way, some way we can regulate that bottom floor or, or some of the other non-residential units to encourage a market going in there. So those are my thoughts. Um, Commissioner, uh, Chairwoman Danikar, I could uh, just weigh in a little bit there and uh, help the commission uh, understand what's what's possible here. Um, so in terms, uh, first of all, just I want to remind that uh, Commissioner Wolken made some suggestions on the motion on the floor, and at some point we want to make sure that those are accepted uh, by the, the first and the second. Um, and then uh, secondly, in terms of the action before the Planning Commission tonight, it's a recommendation to the City Council for a plan development ordinance. And that ordinance uh, can specify uh, uh, allowable uses. <clears throat> so uh, a recommendation could be made relative to uh, short-term rentals. Uh, short-term rentals are allowed downtown. Um, uh, and so if there is a concern about that, um, th that would be something that uh, you could express in your recommendation to the city council. Um, I'll ask Kyle if that discussion has, has come up at all with the applicant before we add a new, if there's the majority of the, the commission that would support that, and including you know, the, the uh, first and, and second here, um you know we would maybe check in with the applicant first and just just make sure that they're okay with that um since it's brand new uh it may not have been ra uh, raised as an issue before uh, but it is something that's within the, the the purview of the commission given that this is a, a an ordinance that would apply to the property uh, I, I saw some heads nodding so i think there are two things we should do we should see if there's support for this idea and then secondly, we should go back and, uh, and uh, accept the suggestions that Commissioner Wilkin made about the private element of maintenance. Kyle might have some uh, background as well, looks like. Uh, yes, yeah, so if I may interject um, real quick, the, this, this is a rental project. And so the short-term rentals for uh, VRBO would not be permissible within this development at all. So we have a city ordinance already in place that prohibits that use. For rentals and so uh it's not even an option on the table for the applicant team that's that's, that's great that was a concern i had because i i know though that still people can still try to get around it you know they still rent it out on a vrbo but uh but that's fine i was just wondering if there was some way to at least make an effort to restrict it so thanks kyle and so uh, if uh, would would uh, commissioner jorgensen accept the uh the condition uh, commissioner walken was suggesting of introducing the word private in condition yep. nine and I, i'm interested in it but i would like to hear first from staff to hear a response from staff about adding this is adding the word private to uh in sentence there um, yes, that, that'd be uh, absolutely fine. It was the intentions of the project to uh, provide for the private maintenance of that uh, paseo, just as it has been historically. Kyle, I'm sorry. Either you broke up or I missed the very first part of what you said. I'm sorry. Uh, the uh, Yes, so the, the intentions of that condition were for a private uh, maintenance agreement, so, uh, just as the project has been under private maintenance um, it throughout, throughout its history. So do you have any objection to adding the word private there to make that uh, transparent? Not at all. I think that's a great, great and comment. And I'm happy to accept it. And I'm happy to accept it also as the second. Right. And uh, Commissioner Walton, you had a second element? I missed that. Did you have a second suggestion? Uh, no, this is Commissioner Wilkin. I didn't have any other suggestions. That's what I thought. And we've already accepted Commissioner uh, Shoresman's uh, I, I wanted to add, uh, just to make a quick couple of statements, um, um, maybe in response to what other commissioners have had to say as well. Um, I'm not uh, concerned about the height. I think if 
we're going to try for 75 feet and we get 25 percent affordable and a lot of uh, and and, uh, and and good density there i think it's worth a try i think this is uh, uh much further in than it was in the very beginning and uh, i think it's a, a much better design than we had before and i think it's worth a try i too have been a bit concerned about the parking i think that the deep backup here is although it's on a first come first serve basis there are 50 spaces available in the structure uh, that can be rented by the month for someone who uh, needs that. Uh, and there may be many people who uh, find a need from time to time of that, but I think it does give us a deep backup. You may know, um, Commissioner Quincy, that actually a parking in the downtown is not per, uh, uh, permitted from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. So for residents, they've either got to find a parking permit or not have a car or have parking on site. Uh, those are the choices right now. So I think it's worth trying to see how it'll play out. Personally, I would much rather also see the, we, we saw something about a transportation demand um, plan, and that's absolutely going in the right direction, especially with car sharing and, uh, and now with better uh, support for bikes. I think that's a good start. I still think what's missing, it, it can't be part of this, but I do believe the city ought to really consider a transit fee that's attached to every residence that's built downtown. Something that would help us really shore up um, uh, whether it's a shuttle system or eventually a streetcar that goes from Cal Poly down to South Higuera. Something that makes it easier for everyone to get around the downtown. It's getting bigger and we're just presuming, well, people are going to work downtown. If they live down there, there's no other transportation needs. But um, I think we've got to think in bigger terms. And uh, I'd like to see us do that sooner than later before everything's built. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank you for those suggestions. I'd like to recognize Commissioner Hopkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and I, I wanted to agree with uh, Commissioner Jorgensen's comments. Um, I feel compelled to support uh, the project's height up to 75 feet. Um, I think the community benefits included, uh, specifically the inclusion of the modern income units. You know, just two meetings ago, we were talking about uh, the difficulty in getting deed restricted units um, on in our arena production. And so I think this is a great opportunity to um, meet that goal with, so to get a guaranteed 13 and then potentially um, some more workforce units depending on where the market ends up um, consistent with our city goals, downtown concept plan, housing element. Um, and secondly, I, I, I think uh, the, sh the modal shift should be pretty interesting for us all to see here. Um, this, this model of almost completely reducing uh, parking. Um, and I, I think it's timely that we're discussing this right now with our climate action plan up next, where we see that uh, two of our greatest sources of carbon emission are um, both uh, building um, emissions and transportation emissions. And so uh, with those with those largest sources of emissions, I think it's also our, our biggest source of opportunity um, to start looking at ways to, to trim that that carbon production. And um, so so for those two reasons, I'm, I'm really supportive of this project. Um, and then and just one more last component on the height. Um, you know, if we look across the street at the parking structure, while it is, uh, I think, four or five story, parking structure, it's only about a 13 foot height difference. And so I think it's consistent with uh, with the surrounding uh, neighbor height, neighborhood height. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Yeah, I have a couple of comments. First of all, uh, what Commissioner um, Quincy said, I thought was good about needing a market downtown as we begin to uh, get more people downtown. Um, it would be nice to have a market. You can buy a quart of milk or a loaf of bread or whatever your particular need is. One thing I thought about is like in San Francisco or other major cities, little uh, local markets pop up. So my hope is that capitalism takes over and someone sees a need and fills that need with, with, a, with a small store downtown. But I certainly think it's a good idea. And I'd urge staff to keep an eye on that concept. And as they work with different developers and different applicants, look for a spot where that might work. And my other comment was, um, mm, I lost it. That was my only comment. Other than that, I fully support the project. Uh, Commissioner Schultzman. 
Yeah, I really appreciate all of the comments and I feel like I can empathize and agree with what much of you have said. I think uh, this is a really nice looking building. I think the applicant has done a really good job of trying to satisfy all the questions and concerns that have come to them uh, to try and make the project um, more appropriate, appealing, um, you know, in line with the character of downtown. Um, I, I do have trouble with the height, um, I, not, not significantly, especially after walking around uh, downtown and kind of, look, kind of looking at the surrounding buildings and how they compare and what it might look like in comparison. Um, but I guess the community benefit trade-off for that height is where I'm still having a little bit of trouble, uh, especially in relation to the pedestrian amenities and the modal shift. Um, I, I understand now that the city council has allowed for the Paseo to be sort of offset and, and be used in, in two ways uh, to justify this project and, uh, and appreciate the preserving of the downtown center. But I, it almost is offset a little bit by the driveway um, that will interfere with pedestrian traffic. Uh, and I also wonder, have a concern about another, as you're heading, you know, heading one way up Marsh Street, right after a light, um, there's this sudden left-hand turn into a driveway. And if it's being used for cars frequently coming in and out because it's being used for rideshare, I just wonder if that sort of negate some of the preservation of the downtown center Paseo because there's this interruption in pedestrian traffic uh, along Marsh Street because of the added driveway. Um, so that's, I, I'm still having a little bit of struggle with that, which is why I asked some of the questions about, you know, other ways of accommodating car traffic that might have not interrupted uh, pedestrians uh, or even eliminating <laughs> the the parking and the driveway all together because again that goes to an even larger potential um, mode shift and and change in behavior um, and it, again it all becomes uh, pretty obvious and and timely with the consideration of the climate action plan tonight and knowing that transportation is one of our biggest threats to climate action and so i'm always looking for ways that we can that we can move towards uh, non-fossil fuel and healthier modes of transportation and ways to encourage that. And I'd love to see some more out of the box thinking around the um, transportation demand management programs and things like that. So I'll just leave that where that is. Um, I'm not seeing any hands up, so I would like to make a few comments. Oh. Uh, One Patrick. more real quick one. I remember my comment. As I was reading the climate action plan and talked about providing free transit throughout the community, I thought that's a, a noble idea, but how do you pay for it? With transit, you have to have a fair box ratio. So you have to have the user or some other source of funding pay for that. So if you put that on the residences, then you're increasing the cost of the residents. So then how do you get affordable housing in your downtown? So I don't really have a solution to all this. I just was pointing out that paradox. And I do agree with uh, Commissioner Shoresman's concepts about the vehicles interrupting the, the traffic. And um, I, I read in the staff report that they tried to negotiate with the owner of that alley, and that would have been good if they had an entrance off that alley, then you could focus all the trips on that one spot, but obviously that didn't work. So anyway, just another comment, it would be nice to condense and put all your uh, vehicle trips in one spot. That's what they tried to do, but it didn't work. So um, my hope is that there's not a lot of conflicts with those vehicles. And also when someone pulls in there to get that spot for a drop off or a pickup, when you pull into that driveway and you get into the building, you're not gonna know if the spot's open or not. So you're gonna pull in there hoping it's open. And if you have a quick drop off, you may double park. So you could have some conflicts with that also, but we'll have to see how it goes. That's all I have. Thank you. Um... But I support this uh, project, and I think that the height issues are of concern, but the, the revised design has taken really good consideration of step back 
uh, dealing with the corner in a way that would allow a, a public domain. We've been wanting to get a project like this, uh, and we've been trying to approve projects like this uh, for some time now at the intersection of Monterey and Santa Rosa was one other case in point where we did uh, we did uh, push the developer and, and uh, got concessions, but then the project went away. And I think this project has come ready. It, uh, they, they're fulfilling a number of the things that we wanted to have to ha happen in downtown. Downtown, including the dedicated affordable housing it's in sync, the parking is in sync with what we uh, was allowed in the Weinman, uh, where there was a carryover of the parking from a previous land use. And so the uh, parking for the Weinman is very minimal and the expectation is it would be offsite, it would be used as uh, the public parking would be, is part of the calculation. This is right next door and it's a site which has laid vacant um, we, we have looked at other projects, approved other projects on that site, and they sort of stopped. So, and it's an important corner, I think. And I, I believe the applicants done a, 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 a best effort to try and make the design so that, um, despite the density, that the fit at the street level is good. So that's uh, so I do support it, uh, and. Uh, I, I think that the, the conditions that we've put are appropriate. So if there are no other conditions that people would like to uh, put before the commission, um, staff, is it pretty clear what the, two, the, the amendments to the motion were? Um, yes, uh, Kyle Bell here. Um, the, the amendments that have been proposed so far are very clear and we have them Jot it down here and we'll be able to implement them into the recommendation. Okay. So um, I, I think we're ready to call for a vote unless there's any last comments by anybody. I don't see any. Uh, so uh, Deputy City, uh, uh, do, will the Deputy City could please call the roll of the motion? Vice Chair Jorgensen. Yes. Commissioner Kahn. Yes. Commissioner Hopkins. Yes. Commissioner Quincy. Yes. Commissioner Shoresman. Yes. Commissioner Walken. Yes. Chair Dondekar. Yes. Motion so, passes. The motion passes unanimously. Um, I wonder if the commissioners would like to take a five minute, 10 minute break. I would. Yes, I hear yeah. nods, I see nods. Let's take a, a five minute break so we can move on quickly. We're all at home. Thank you. Five minute break it is. Thank you. Um, I'd like to reconvene the um, planning commission meeting and start a review, of, I'll start on item two, which is a public hearing item it, uh, before us. And it is to review the 2020 Climate Action Plan update. Um, would, uh, is it, Chris, are you going to be uh, presenting this or is Teresa McLeish going to be presenting? Special Project Manager Teresa McLee, please uh, present the report. Okay. So, Good Commissioner uh, Chairwoman Danikar, it looks like uh, Chris's mic has been uh, maybe muted by uh, Deputy Chief Clark. Thank you. You should be good now, Chris. All right. And Michael, did you want to give an introduction? Or? Well, uh, no, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. And, okay. Yeah, great. 
So I'm uh, Chris Reed, a sustainability manager at the city of San Luis Obispo, and I'll be joined by Teresa McClish, special projects manager out of community development tonight. Um, and we'll be giving an overview of our climate action plan update. It's a very exciting uh, moment for us to be able to bring this back to you. Uh, as some of you may recall, we were before you in April of last year and presented on a pretty similar set of topics, although obviously I've had the time to work with uh, many folks in our community, uh, many technical experts to refine and improve and, and bring a public review draft for you this evening. So staff uh, comes to the Planning Commission tonight with the following recommendation uh, to adopt the Planning Commission resolution, which is pro provided as attachment one, recommending that the City Council adopt the initial study for negative declaration for the project and uh, adopt the climate action plan for community recovery as consistent with the general plan, including California Environmental Quality Act, greenhouse gas emissions thresholds and guidance. Um, as some of you have noted in some of our correspondence, this is a, a large document. There's a lot there. So we thought uh, before we got into the presentation, we just give a brief overview of where we're headed as a roadmap for the presentation. So we'll start with just some brief policy context and some background as to uh, why we're here tonight with the Climate Action Plan. Uh, very important for the Planning Commission is the discussion of the Climate Action Plan as a qualified greenhouse gas emissions reduction strategy. So we'll talk a bit about how we are able to uh, make the finding that we are in fact a qualified climate action plan or we have one and what that means for future development. Uh, we'll give a brief overview of what's in the plan itself and then Teresa will focus on the CEQA general plan and ISD components. So just to start, as, as many of you know, we've had an adopted climate action plan since 2012. Um, it's obviously an older plan now and it was focused on a greenhouse gas emissions reduction target year of 2020. Um, obviously, a lot's changed since then. The urgency of the climate crisis has become more pronounced. Climate action has become a, a higher priority in the community, and our council has reflected that in our 2017 to 19 financial plan, where climate action has made a major city goal for the first time. And again, in the 19 to 21 financial plan, where climate action was again made a major city goal. In both of those work programs, updating this climate action plan was a primary task and continues to be a primary task. In September of 2018, we, we went before council at a study session to present various options for reduction targets that we could pursue through the planning process. And at that time, planning commission, or sorry, the city council gave us unanimous uh, direction to move forward with developing a plan that puts us on a path towards carbon neutrality by 2035, which at the time, and, and still continues to this day to be one of the most ambitious local government climate action targets um, in the country. Uh, we spent all last year developing a plan, including, as I mentioned before, coming before this body uh, in spring of last year. And then in December, we held a study session before council where we presented essentially the, all the content that you see in the plan before you tonight uh, with less detail, but more or less the same substance. Uh, we had an open house at City Hall and then had an actual study session and asked council and the community, you know, are we generally heading in the right direction? Are the way we're organizing the approach to climate action and carbon neutrality consistent with the community's expectations? Are the actions we're proposing both sufficient and consistent with the values of our community? When we were directed, um, 18 months ago to develop a climate action plan that had a carbon neutrality target, uh, we obviously understood the uh, how ambitious that was and how hard that was going to be to develop. And so we spent that time really doing as much research as possible, diving deep into the liter literature, really engaging with our peer cities, both nationally and internationally, um, and even some of the larger uh, global cities to really understand other people that have taken, other cities that have taken this goal seriously what have they done to be successful and where have they faced challenges? And across all of that, we identified sort of five guiding principles. I mean, there could be six, there could be four, but the way we group them is really in these five sort of categories. And this has really driven the way that we look at our work and approach the work. And I presented this numerous times to council and the community and people generally, this has been well accepted. And in brief, the, the five guiding principles are first, that systems are really responsible for the climate crisis. And therefore, they're the best opportunity to address the climate crisis. 
what we mean by systems are, are the ways that our transportation systems exist or the ways that we move um, around our city, the energy systems, how we receive energy and, and what the impacts of those are. So while some caps might, climate action plans might focus on you know, a campaign to get a neighborhood to recycle more, we're really focused much higher level on how do we influence the systems that create climate crisis. The second is that climate crisis and social equity must be addressed together. We know that uh, it's both consistent with our community's values to address equity and environmental justice, but also it's really uh, critical that if we're going to achieve the reductions that our council and community expect of us, everyone needs to be able to participate uh, in, in the outcome of the actions. And in fact, we need to use this, this moment to create actions that make our community more equitable. The third principle is that, that organizations are uniquely capable of certain actions. You know, the city is a specific type of organization. We have a specific purview of, of, of authority and capabilities, and, and we're not good at some things. And so we've really tried to focus with this plan on those things that we are especially capable or, or maybe need to build capacity to become capable of. Um, as you'll see in an action in the plan, there's also work moving forward to work with our community partners to identify what they're particularly good at and what they want to take on to achieve the targets. The fourth principle is that leadership is really needed in this moment. We know that globally greenhouse gas emissions have to get to carbon neutral by 2050. So that's the entirety of the global emissions need to get to neutral by 2050 if we're to stave off the worst of the climate catastrophes that we, we expect to see in our lifetimes. And so obviously if the world needs to achieve that by then, leadership, leadership cities like ours need to take action um, much sooner than that. The upside to that though is that being a leadership city has already begun to invite a tremendous amount of intellectual and capital resources to our work. And the final is, uh, uh, principle is kind of one that emerged out of the process. And that's that climate action is really a path for community recovery. Uh, through the development of the plan, we had always sort of expected implementation to occur in a time that's sort of front edge of the climate crisis. So we knew that developing an economy focused on clean, green future is important. We knew that uh, focusing on public health and equity is important. Um, I don't think we expected, well, we didn't expect there to be a pandemic that actually tested those principles out. But certainly when we think about the actions that we, we present tonight and the the way that we organize them, we're hopeful that at their implementation, they can actually be a driver for how we recover from the impacts of COVID-19. The plan was, was deeply driven by community input. We held dozens of, of events, workshops and open houses, community meetings, uh, farmer's market booths, pop-ups at thrift stores and grocery stores, um, uh, you know, extensive social media posting, uh, several open city hall campaigns. Uh, we actually had a, an outreach uh, a goal for how many people we would speak with, how many events we'd have, what the sort of demographic characteristics that we want to make sure that we reached out to. And we were able to achieve all those and spoke with over a thousand community members and dozens of businesses and, and nonprofits. So that that we really feel that 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 input has has broadly informed the plan before you tonight. Again, uh, to respond to some of the comments on the length and the complexity of the plans, um, there are two volumes. There are three technical appendices and the environmental documentation, and we know that's that's a lot. Um, the way we think about it is volume two is really if you were just doing a traditional climate action plan, you needed the pieces. That, that's volume two. That's the background. Um, how do we get there? What's the work program? Um, what are the financing and funding mechanisms, et cetera? Uh, and then the technical appendices, appendix A, the GHG inventory and forecast, B, the quantification report, see the GHG thresholds and checklist and the supporting environmental documentation are all the, the really background and undergirding information presented for transparency and, and reporting requirements. I think volume one is, is sort of a, a new idea that we had. It's the thing that I'm most proud of as uh, one of the project managers on this. And I think a lot of us are most proud and interested in. And we took this opportunity to, to say, let's not just create a plan with a bunch of ideas, but let's actually host storytelling activities with our community to imagine if we were to be successful in our work, what could our community look like in 2035? We're going to close our eyes and imagine a 2035 where, where we're thriving despite a rapidly changing climate, where we've achieved the sort of economic development and, and equity goals that we want to. What does it look and feel like to live in that space? And so that's really what volume one is there is about there. Um, we'd love to talk about volume one all night, but uh, for the decision-making process before you, we're really going to focus on volume two. 
And specifically, we're going to focus on why this Climate Action Plan is a qualified greenhouse gas emissions reduction plan. Um, this slide and the next slide are very information heavy. They're, they're meant to sort of retain information for public record. And so folks looking at this in the future can easily look at it. Don't expect to read it all right now, but just wanted to note that uh, in the California code, there's a specific set of uh, pieces that go into having a qualified climate action plan. And the reason it's important to have one is that once we have a qualified greenhouse gas emissions reduction strategy or climate action plan, that's adopted and has all of the characteristics described on this slide. When development comes for environmental review under CEQA in the future, if they can illustrate consistency with that qualified climate action plan, they can actually avoid having to do a greenhouse gas emissions analysis in their uh, environmental review. So they can get out of the GHG analysis in their um, ICN or in their EIR. And so it's a really big um, opportunity to have development sort of much more easily show consistency with our ambitions, our climate ambitions as a community in the city, while also making, providing much more certainty to the developer uh, that, that they're gonna um, you know, benefit from, from this. And in short, to have a qualified plan, we have to have an inventory and forecast, which again is Appendix A. We have to um, establish a target, which we do. We establish our carbon neutrality as a, by 2035 as a, as a ambitious target that, that is aspirational, but then we also uh, adopt a target for 2030 that's consistent with state law called SB 32. Um, we identify and quantify the emissions reductions that will occur from both state and existing actions, as well as those proposed as foundational actions. Um, and then we establish a mechanism to monitor and evaluate the program. Those are the administrative actions you see in the final chapter. And finally, we, we follow a public process to adopt the plan, which is what we're doing right now. It's the second of too much stuff on a slide slide, so uh, apologies, but we just wanted to share this. This is really in one graphic, a description of what is in the climate action plan. We've organized all of our measures into six uh, topical categories. We're calling, calling them the pillars of decarbonization. So we have six pillars. And across all of those, we have 27 foundational actions that we propose to either uh, initiate or complete in the next three years uh, ahead of the next update of the Climate Action Plan. You'll notice that lead by example doesn't have uh, reductions associated with it. Uh, that's referring to our municipal government operations. And just to avoid double counting, because many of those emissions occur in our community, we have um, estimated some reductions, but we don't count that towards our targets. Just wanted to explain that. But this waterfall graphic really shows, you know, we forecasted a certain level of emissions in 2035. And then through the five pillars we have reductions for and state laws and programs, we show substantial progress towards our carbon neutrality target by 2035. And we show compliance and ability to achieve our, our SB 32 consistent 2030 target. Um, but we also show that there are um, a real amount of emissions remaining in 2035 that we don't yet know how to reduce. So. While we do still suggest, or, or um, our recommendation will be to adopt the 2035 carbon neutrality goal, what these remaining emissions suggest to us is that we really need to continue to work and allow technology to evolve and continue to assess adoption uh, curves of technologies and really see if the federal government is going to step up and play a role in climate action to see if we can continue to bend that arrow downwards and, and truly get to carbon neutrality by 2035. Now, each of the six pillars, in addition to having foundational actions, also has a sector specific goal associated with it. Um, the pillars and goals are, are here. And so for the lead by example pillar, we'll be proposing to council to adopt the goal of a carbon neutral government operations by 2030. For the clean energy systems pillar, it's 100% carbon free electricity by 2020. And we've already made progress and achieved this through our participation in Monterey Bay Community Power. Uh, three in green buildings pillar, we're proposing a goal of no net new building emissions from on-site energy use by 2020, and a 50% reduction uh, in on existing on-site building emissions by 2030. Our fourth pillar is connected community. And our goal here is to achieve the general plan mode split objective by 2030 with the 40% of the uh, remaining vehicle miles that are occurring in, in single occupancy or um, um, lightweight vehicles that uh, those are all occurring by uh, electric vehicles, or 40% of those vehicle miles traveled are by electric vehicles. And then the last two uh, pillars and goals are circular economy. This has to do with uh, uh, diverting organic waste from the landfill. So the goal here is a 75% diversion by 2025, and that's consistent with, uh, with another state law 
and then 90% by 2035. And finally, natural solutions, where our goal is to just increase carbon sequestration in the green belt and urban forests, and to do that ongoing through 2035. Now, in addition to the substantive greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals, uh, pillars, goals, and foundational actions, we also have a number of administrative actions on sort of how we do the things we're going to do and, and, and how we're going to continue to learn and update the cap so we can continue to bend that curve downwards towards carbon neutrality. The first, and this is really one of the most important for us, is a, an action to regularly update the cap, but in a very specific way so that it occurs just before the every other financial plan process. So as we adopt the cap update, we have a work program and then that flows right into the financial plan so that we can sync up financial and staff resources with the community's desires on climate action for that particular draft. This is also where we talk about monitoring and reporting plans, um, disclo uh, disclosing our greenhouse gas emissions information on public portals so folks can have you know, really transparent access to the data that we use to develop our plans. And finally, to develop a mitigation program for new development to illust illustrate consistency with the cap. And this is an example of another action that we're actually already sort of implementing and will be complete and concurrent. And it's um, something that uh, Teresa will, will talk about shortly. So that really wraps up the, the substantive greenhouse gas emissions reduction component of the presentation. And I'll hand it over to Teresa McClish to discuss uh, CEQA. Great, thank you, Chris, and uh, good evening, members of the commission. Uh, as Chris earlier previewed, uh, this climate action plan uh, can be considered a qualified uh, greenhouse gas reduction plan, and uh, therefore we're able to use this as a tool to be able to tier and streamline uh, GHG emission analyses for uh, discretionary projects that come forward in the future and need uh, CEQA review. So the, um, this, this document, this guidance document, uh, helps provide us the guidance going forward in looking at uh, land use and, and development changes. It provides uh, numeric th thresholds of significance that will um, be used for some projects that aren't able to use the streamlining checklist. And in this, we're able to uh, actually, as Chris just mentioned, start implementing the Climate Action Plan. And it helps us demonstrate uh, how the city can um, uh, make uh, substantial progress uh, toward these uh, carbon neutrality uh, goals that, are, that were just discussed. So it is uh, both a... Um, a tool and an impl implementation tool for development and an implementation measure for the cl climate action plan. So the document, the guidance document includes um, a checklist and we call it the CAP check checklist and it's uh, usable for uh, projects going forward in a qualitative manner and it um, asks two basic groups of questions. One is that project or plan uh, consistent with the demographic forecasts that were used in the climate action plan, and those are based on our general plan, land use, and circulation elements. And then a set of questions that tie directly to the applicable uh, pillars and foundational actions in the climate action plan itself. And projects that are able to use this uh, checklist, it's a yes or no checklist, I'll give you an example in a moment, and then they're done. And that's the streamlining uh, uh, tool that we've described. Uh, projects that aren't immediately able to demonstrate a consistency with the checklist then do a uh, quantitative analysis and uh, compare against the thresholds of significance that are also in the document. And these are, again, the uh, thresholds that were developed and derived from forecasts um, in the Climate Action Plan. Next slide. Chris, next slide. There we go, thanks. And so this is a snippet of the checklist and uh, you can see it's organized by the pillars and it lists out uh, different foundational actions with this yes or no uh, um, checklist and some area for explanation. It is supposed to be a very, hopefully, quick and qualitative review, but it does provide that 
uh, evidence needed uh, for CEQA in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. And here's just a flow chart on how this is all supposed to work. Uh, so these again are projects that already are preparing an initial study under the uh, in accordance with CEQA, um, and they can then use for the for the greenhouse uh, gas emissions impact category. They can use the checklist and, or a quantitative analysis in accordance with this chart. And uh, this is just a different depiction of how uh, we ask the question, uh, is a project, is it consistent with the forecasts uh, in the general plan and zoning uh, designations? And then check, check, check uh, in accordance to the pillars and the foundational actions in the climate action plan and you're done. Or you go ahead and if you're not uh, consistent, you have something in your project that is not uh, necessarily immediately uh, consistent with the climate action plan, then you prepare your, uh, again, your quantitative analysis and compare against those thresholds of significance. And you may have to um, include uh, different mitigation measures in your project uh, going forward to avoid any potential significant impacts. Next slide. And um, in, in addition, uh, we've made sure to uh, compare and closely review and compare the Climate Action Plan and the uh, guidance uh, document with our general plan uh, to make sure that we're not uh, running into any inconsistencies with policies and programs and implementations in the plan. And indeed, uh, we found it is consistent and it very much is specifically consistent with many of the policies and programs uh, in the general plan and in fact helps implement those plans and policies. So certainly policies in the conservation and open space element, uh, many having to deal with energy efficiency, um, policies in the circulation element regarding mode, uh, circulation modes, of travel, um, and uh, of course the land use element, housing element, and uh, even the water and wastewater elements. So um, that review was prepared and those uh, specific policies are listed in your uh, packet. Next slide. And uh, finally, before you is a recommendation uh, for you for you to make a recommendation to the City Council to approve the uh, necessary uh, CEQA document on the Climate Action Plan itself, as well as the Thresholds and Guidance document, and whether or not implementation of the of this policy document and, and, and guidance uh, in and of itself would create any potentially significant impacts on the environment. So even though it's not a development proposal, of course, uh, uh, some of the um, promotion of uh, uh, certain types of in infrastructure was evaluated, you know, whether it be solar array or pra uh, practices, whether it be a carbon farming or, or uh, tree planting, was all evaluated in accordance with CEQA. And it was determined that there are uh, no resulting potentially significant, significant impacts. And with that, next slide. And just in schedule and next steps, we are in public review on the CEQA document and the, the Climate Action Plan and Guidance document. And that should close on uh, next week on July 22nd. And then we're off to City Council tentatively scheduled for August 18th. And this will provide another um, uh, opportunity to preview and, and uh, consider the Climate Action Plan for Community Recovery that's before you this evening, as well as this uh, greenhouse gas emissions thresholds and guidance document that really ties ties it to the land use uh, purview that you see every other Tuesday, as well as the CEQA document. So we're pretty excited for that. And I'd like to um, just mention as we go forward, uh, we do have uh, uh, Eric Feldman and Kel Kelsey Bennett um, on the line with us this evening 
uh, they did the heavy lifting and prepared the technical analysis uh, for the GHG uh, emissions thresholds and guidance, uh, as well as the CEQA review. And they're here tonight um, uh, to help answer questions. So with that, um, Chris, if you have any closing statements, please uh, pipe in. But otherwise, the recommendation, again, is to adopt the resolution before you recommending that the council adopt the climate action plan, find it consistent with the general plan and in inclusive of the California Environmental Quality Act, greenhouse gas emissions threshold and guidance. It's quite a mouthful, as well as adopt the initial study and negative declaration for the project. And with that, we'd be very happy to answer questions. Thank you very much uh, for a, a, a really good overview of what the team has been doing. Uh, much appreciated. And uh, your enthusiasm is palpable, so uh, it's good to see. Um, commissioners, I, I'm going to call on each of you to see if you have questions for the staff. Um, Commissioner Hopkins. Yeah, so I have a few questions. Uh, the first is process based. So. Mm -hmm. In regards to the development checklist, is would this be something that is approved uh, ministerial ministerially by staff, or would this have? Is there any process where this would come before the planning commission or any other commission to review and and determine for consistency? Right, great question. Uh, so this would be applied to projects that um, that already are in the discretionary well, realm and are not otherwise exempt from CEQA. And so these are projects that are already uh, having an initial study uh, prepared. And uh, just in the, in the specific impact category of greenhouse gas emissions, the checklist may be used. And if, it, if, it's, um, if it's found to be consistent with the climate action plan, that checklist just becomes part of the record for the initial study. Um, and if the quantitative analysis has to take place, then that becomes the part, part of the study. And then the project um, would be part of the uh, declaration, whether it's a negative declaration or mitigated negative de declaration or EIR that comes before the planning commission. Okay, great. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you. And then, um, I'm happy to see equity as one of the guiding principles of the of the climate action plan, um, but just had some questions. You know, regressive cost is something that always comes up in this conversation to to more low income households, um, and climate adaptation. While of course, a noble effort, huge effort by the city, um, always comes with high upfront costs. You know, usually save on operations, but it does come with an upfront investment. So outside of you know Monterey Bay Community Power policies. Um, Will there be any financial resources or financial programs dedicated to making sure that this cost is offset for low-income households? Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for your question. Um, I just want to take take a quick quick step back and just talk about, about equity and, and how we've really tried to do the work. And um, we try to focus at really just just by naming it be, be a core consideration that we continually remind ourselves and ask ourselves about and really starting to delve into the concepts of representational equity. So uh, making sure that we are talking to representative uh, community members and, and folks that um, you know, may not traditionally participate in the process as well as distributional um, equity so that the, the both the burdens and the benefits are, are distributed in an equitable way. And I think that there's a lot of learning that was done and, I, and I'm hopeful that we're able to to take that learning and really leverage it moving forward. And I can just give an example of that. So um, green buildings, I think it's 2.1 or 1.2 is, is about the building decarbonization retrofit program, right? Um, and that's really focusing on how can we equitably and in a um, with a really economic development uh, and, and improving folks, helping folks who want to improve their homes have access to financing and uh, do that in a really equitable way. And we've actually started as we're developing our project plan to create uh, specific equity lenses that are primary in the project plan so that we, we commit to representational equity and we create a working group that is broadly representative, um, that we are committed to distributional equity uh, and generational equity so that 
the work that we do isn't just distributed equally across the community, but it's actually equitably and addresses some of the inequalities that exist. I think the question you ask is a really important one around uh, financial costs. And so one of, like, as an example of how we're thinking about this uh, in that exact program is, you know, how do we, um, for buildings where there are low income um, households, how do we ensure that we are able to use our role as a convener to work with our regional energy network, to work with PG&E, Monterey Bay Community Power, and stack all the existing financing and resources and make it very easy to then bring those resources to folks to implement um, some of the you know, programs that we can bring forward and help them with. And so that's one of the ways we're thinking about it. It is something that will have to be, it's not something we can just say in the plan that it's going to be equitable and it will be. It's something we'll have to be very intentional about and work hard and, and work with smart folks in our community and, and outside to make sure that we continue that really dogged focus and all the programs we implement moving forward. Okay, and that actually ties it perfectly into my, my next and final question, which was, you talked about uh, monitor, annual monitoring or, or regularly checking in on progress. Um, and I just wanted to know if there will be a component of that that does cover the equity side and if there's any uh, any type of, uh, uh, if there's quantitative as well as qualita qualitative measures that can be used to, to review that. Thank you, Commissioner. That that is not currently conceived, but I think it's a it's a great idea, and I think we'll take that co that comment and see if we can incorporate that. Um, so, so thank you for that. Okay, thank you. And that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Jorgensen. Oops, sorry. Any questions right this moment? Thank you, uh, Commissioner Khan. I don't have any questions at this moment. Also. Thank you. Commissioner Quincy. I don't have any questions either. Thank you. Commissioner Shawson. Yeah, just one point of clarification, I guess. Um, you talked about frequency of revisions for the plan, and you mentioned it in relation to the budget process, I think, or the funding process. So mm -hmm. does that mean that the proposal or the um, I guess the, the plan is to revise the document every two years, or what's the frequency? Thank you, Commissioner. I think I, I misspoke. So the idea is that we would do it every other financial plan. So it would be uh, on a four, this first one will be like on a, a two and a half year cycle, but then thereafter it'll be on a four year cycle with the off financial plan where we'd be coming back with our greenhouse gas emissions, like uh, inner year update and monitoring reporting update. Okay, so every four years basically would be the plan re Correct. revision. Correct. And then um, how often would you be able to gather the data necessary to use you know, data on progress um, to make decisions about whether or not our, our goals are in reasonable, mm -hmm. <laughs> achievable, uh, achievable limits, I guess. Thank you, Commissioner. So one of the, the main challenges or a primary challenge with climate action monitoring and reporting is that we can monitor and report out on um, if we've been implementing what we said we would do. So do we do the actions we said we would do? And are they working like we thought they would? Um, but then we also have to re-inventory our emissions. And all those things, although, although those things are related, there could also be economic changes, uh, weather changes, et cetera, that, that affect our total emissions. So you're, you're right to note that there are data limitations on our like the the level of detail that we can uh, monitor and report on. That said, our plan is um, every other cycle, so every two years to come back with a, an inventory. It will be a couple of years old, so you know we may not pick up the the signal from the actions that we've recently been um, monitoring. But we will have a pretty good sense of if we've been doing the work we we committed to and what our expected emissions reductions from those are and if in the recent past we're in the right direction. So it's always a bit of a juggling act there, but that certainly is the intent moving forward. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Wilkin. Uh, yes, I just wanted to follow up on a question that Commissioner Hopkins had regarding the uh, GHG checklist. And I thought where the commissioner was going was whether the checklist itself was an administrative um, 
action? And I think the answer is yes, but maybe staff could just clarify whether the, the uh, development of the checklist and its amendment from time to time is, is something that staff would do administratively. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, and, and unless there is something that was so substantive that we would that it, it impacts the climate action plan or something when we, we would take that back. But otherwise, yes. OK, thank you. I just wanted to uh, make that clear. Thank you. Um, I, I had a question or maybe it's a comment. Um, Every time the climate action plan has come through planning commission, you know, I've been struck by the fact that it is systemic. It is about city actions. Um, it is about showing uh, leadership at a larger scale. Uh, but then you have agendas such as green buildings, uh, seventy-five percent reduction in organics, uh, which were in one of your slides. Um, mm -hmm. And you know these things don't really happen unless there's participation by community at a very micro level, uh, at the level of households, and the, the fact that they feel committed and on board and take the actions to stop, uh, you know, organics at the source. And I've just just uh, uh, been struck by the fact that my sense is we don't do enough to get community on board about climate action planning. So it's something that, you know, you guys are doing to us when we talk at the neighborhood level. Um, unfortunately, even something like the Monterey Bay electricity thing, if you looked at the conversations on next door, uh, which I'm somewhat, uh, I do tend to look at, um, it's, it seems like uh, we need to do more to make these um, actions uh, empower individuals and families and neighborhoods to participate and contribute. Otherwise, it's going to continue to look like top down. Did you have any thoughts on that? Thank you, Commissioner. It is it is a uh, it is true that I think it, they're both. Um, sufficient, uh, or they're both necessary conditions, but not sufficient on their own. Um, we traditionally, a lot of climate action work in, in California has really focused on, you know, if, if we could just create a, a web app that allowed people to look at their own emissions and then take action, or if we were to create a website where people could see how great energy efficiency is, or how great organics recycling is, or if we could create a neighborhood level program, um, and those things are, are really expensive and hard to do well and sustain over time. And we've seen traditionally they, they don't move the needle, particularly because the systems that those programs are embedded in aren't built for them to, to function well. And so, um, you know, really trying to focus on this foundational steps of creating systems that are easier to do those types of activities in. Now, that said, the what we what I hope is we're not misconstrued to say is that only systems matter It's the only thing that anyone should care about It's what we're focusing on right now. But, um, you know, we're also able to, to I think you walk and chew gum at the same time. And what we're also trying to do uh, is work with community partners and work with community groups. So, for example, we worked with um, EcoSlow to submit a grant to plant 100 street trees and in doing that we built, helped them build capacity. Um, through that funding source to develop a volunteer network for planting street trees so that moving forward people that care about trees can you know sort of dial into this um, this volunteer network that's being run by a nonprofit who's particularly good at running those types of programs um, the slow climate coalition is taking proposals from community members to, uh, de to develop programs that really do uh, lead to, to community-led efforts and initiatives. And one example is, is sort of this like block by block level idea of, of um, creating neighborhood level organizations and, and, and conversations around this topic so that folks uh, in their homes and in their neighborhoods feel uh, compelled and, and um, um, interested in, in implementing. And then the final thing that, that we're currently working on, although there, there are many others, but what I want to mention is we've also convened meetings with uh, local government staff throughout the Central Coast and Monterey Bay Community Power, the heads of uh, or the, the executive directors of a number of, of equity focus groups, and then also the major nonprofits that focus on environmental education and action 
And we're really trying to understand how can we um, harness levels of scale to bring those types of activities to our community in a meaningful and sustaining and enduring way and have them be operated by the kinds of organizations that are particularly good at operating them. So I guess the short of it is, is that we, we completely agree and we're, we're trying to do with this climate action plan is establish that foundation so that those types of programs are really successful moving forward. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I understand the evolution and I'm glad to know that you're thinking about it. And I did see the eco slow tree down one of the streets I was walking on and the fact that it's, it's the neighbors who are watering and looking after the tree and so on, which is a very positive message of, of, yes. of um, appropriation by the community. But, you know, I would really love to see more of that kind of community engagement faster because otherwise this systemic thinking uh, sets the infrastructure but you know i can't tell you how few times i've seen people using those little containers for co for green compost that were distributed they got thrown in the trash heap because there really was no backup there wasn't an explanation there wasn't a call to say do this because it's good for the environment it's easy to do here's what you can do I mean, it was a, a great idea, but the follow through was just so not taken up, you know. Uh, so I, I really wish we could think about, I mean, we would be at the cutting edge if we thought about ways in which we engage the energy of the community, I think. I don't know if other commissioners um, you know, share my thoughts about this. No, I think your analogy of the uh, green waste containers or the uh, little food waste containers is a great analogy. I use it. I use it quite regularly, but I use it because I know it and I know what to do, but I was never, you know, told more about it. So I agree with you. So if are there any other comments, commissioners? Uh, if not, um, do I have, oh, oh um, I wonder if there are any comments on this. Deputy City Clerk, do we have any public comments on this item? We do have two uh, comments on this, uh, Mr. Justin Bradshaw and Mr. Eric Viam. One moment and I will get Mr. Bradshaw's Mike live. Mr. Bradshaw, your mic should be live now. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great, thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Justin Bradshaw and I'm a home and business owner here in SLO. I'm also here representing the perspective of the SLO Climate Coalition on this critical climate action plan update. Our fully, fully volunteer organization is dedicated to bringing expertise, creativity, and resources to champion equitable, high-impact climate solutions and inspire other communities to do the same. We've been privileged to work closely with city staff as they craft this vision for our future. We can't thank them enough for their tireless work developing this forward-thinking climate action plan. If there was a reason it took eight years to update the original aspirational plan to the one you see today, it's because we didn't have Chris Reed. He perhaps does the work of three average city employees and still manages to be creative and open to the process. Thank you, Chris, and thanks to the entire staff. So we support the staff recommendation to move this plan forward to council, but first want to highlight for you two of our favorite components of it. The first document, Stories from 2035, is a brilliant way to make a complicated administrative document immensely accessible to the community. We believe this innovative approach will bring more people into the public process and help climate policy touch home with new audiences. If you skip to the technical part two, you missed out. Go back and check out those stories. We also strongly support having the CEQA compliance checklist. Being able to avoid a full EIR will help developers plan and streamline their projects with our city goals and thresholds in mind from the beginning. This ingeniously simple screening tool will perhaps unintuitively 
be also likely to result in less GHG emissions than if the projects are forced, as in the status quo, to do, the, to do their own costly and time-consuming GHG sequel reviews. Finally, we believe this climate action plan shows true leadership by putting social equity and local systems in their rightful place to address the climate crisis and community recovery. Thank you for your time tonight and your dedication to keeping slow beautiful and slowly making it better. Thank you. Okay, and then we also have Mr. Eric Viam, whose mic is self-muted. Eric, oh, very good. You should be Great. Uh, Honorable Commission, my name is Eric Viam. I am a resident of San Luis Obispo, and I also chair the Slow Climate Coalition. Uh, I want to appreciate Justin Bradshaw for his comments. I wasn't intending to make comments because uh, he had it covered, but I, I did uh, see an opportunity to speak to the insight that Commissioner Danikar had elevated in terms of the necessity for deep and meaningful community engagement as the uh, as a, as a, a requirement, as a, again a necessity for us to be successful in. Um, cultivate and creating a culture of uh, action and awareness and climate leadership in our community. And I want to share with you that uh, our coalition is working, uh, again, with the support of city staff, um, investigating box scale uh, community engagement programs. And there's there's a variety of models that are uh, um, in, in various stages of development around the country. And we're, in the, we're uh, developing a matrix based off of our, our local needs and evaluating uh, existing programs and or uh, creation of our own program targeted at building relationships neighbor to neighbor. Uh, using that those relationships as a uh, foundation for uh, resiliency, for disaster preparedness, uh, for communication, uh, for for um, strengthening political will, and also for uh, for uh, um, facilitating action, uh, both on the individual family level and at the neighborhood uh, um, scale around meaningful actions that, that engage uh, both the families and, and their neighbors. So I just wanna let you know that that's something we're, we're thinking about, we recognize the importance of that and we're active in, in uh, and developing uh, further uh, what that may look like. So, so look forward to, to more of that in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, so there, are, if there are no more public comments, um, would, would the commissioners like to deliberate on this issue? Are there any points you'd like to make, or are we at a position where we, we would have a motion and a second? Yes, Commissioner Shawson. Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to make one point, I guess, and draw everybody's attention to um, one graph in the document that I found particularly um, Noteworthy, I guess, maybe a little bit alarming. Um, but on page 19 of volume two, there's a chart that shows greenhouse gas emissions um, from 2005 to 2035, and it's uh, it's a a line graph, and it shows you know the the blue is sort of if I'm reading this correctly, the the blue line uh, is is sort of where we've come and where we want to go. Uh, and from 2005 to 2020, it appears that we've come down by barely 100,000 from just shy of 400,000 at the baseline to 300,000. And in the next 15 years, it's projected that we would want to go down another, gosh, 250,000. Um, and so that chart just uh, really hit home for me and sort of uh, led to some of my comments in our earlier agenda item about um, changing transportation patterns and that we have a lot of work to do in what is proposed to be a pretty short amount of time. And 
we really need to get serious about this. We need to find some real structural ways of creating that behavior change that I think you were talking about, uh, Chair Dan Dakar and Eric BM was talking about as well. Behavior change is difficult. It's hard to get people to do the right thing, even though they know it's the right thing sometimes because it requires behavior change and behavior change is hard. So um, we have a lot of work to do, but I think we definitely need to do it. And, and this, plan is a is a good way of, of getting us in the right direction. I appreciate all the work that staff has done on it. And I'm really glad that we have the sustainability manager now that we didn't have several years ago. So thank you for being here, Chris, and I look forward to voting on this. Thank you. Uh, are there any comments? And if not, could I, would somebody like to make a, a I motion? have a comment. Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, this is Commissioner Wilkin. I had a couple of suggestions. Uh, first of all, the uh, I think the plan is uh, it's ambitious and, and it hits the right areas to achieve um, the GHG reductions um, that we're aiming for. Uh, but first of all, uh, regarding adapt climate adaptation and resilience, um, there is one very brief mention of that in the plan, but because it's so important and is a, um, a key part of the, the uh, city major goal on climate action, I just thought there could maybe be a little more uh, on climate uh, adaptation and resilience, maybe in the introduction to volume two, maybe just a paragraph that states um, its importance and how it's being addressed, namely, namely that as my understanding, as I understand it, it's being addressed in the update to the safety element. So um, if if staff could just include that much somewhere in the introduction in a prominent place, um, that would be my suggestion. And my second suggestion has to do with a uh, specific uh, action. It's under circular economy uh, 1.1. And this is the action that calls for an ordinance requiring organic waste uh, service or subscription. And under the equity consideration, I think uh, what needs to go in there is is the uh, likelihood that there would be a rate increase to pay for this program and that and that that rate increase would or could adversely affect lower income people. So I think that's I think that's the equity consideration for that um, for that um, action. So I think that should be included. Uh, in the plan under equity considerations for circular economy 1.1. So those would be my two suggestions. Otherwise, um, uh, I would be in support of uh, everything else that's in the plan and in the uh, the uh, GHG thresholds and guidance. Would you like to condition that uh, in some way? This is a recommendation to the to the council that we are making. So, um, Steph, what would be the best way to communicate this? Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair and uh, Commissioner. I, I think you know we, we heard loud and clear that uh, highlighting the adaptation component is important. In fact, I committed to adding it to the presentation, and I didn't. So, apologies for that. But certainly, um, it, it is a critical piece of this. We know that. Climate change is, is, is baked into the atmosphere, and we'll need to respond to the, the climate crisis, even as we uh, reduce our emissions. And, and in fact, we are um, kicking off a project right now to really integrate climate adaptation and resilience into the general plan, uh, and then subsequently into implementing plans. And that's happening through a, a Caltrans grant that we were uh, able to uh, win uh, last year. So um, absolutely, we can. Um, we're happy to add additional content on our uh, adaptation resilience efforts. And I should say all of that's on top of the hazard mitigation plan recently adopted by our council and led by our fire department, and just the tireless work that, that our fire department and public safety officials do for fuel reduction and other public safety work. So, but the short answer is absolutely, we'll be happy to answer that or to add that into um, volume two, and likely we'll, we'll like to add a short dis uh, discussion about that in volume one as well. And in regards to the um, circular economy 1.1, I, I think we had intended to, to add that piece in and through the editing process, 
it just didn't discuss that. And so that we, we appreciate that catch and, and we'd, be, we'd be happy to add a discussion uh, about that issue into that action. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Commissioner Hopkins was next and then Commissioner Jorgensen. Thank you. I, I just wanted to reiterate um, adding to any kind of annual reporting um both qualitative and quantitative uh, measures for measuring equity and and reevaluating that on a regular basis but i just wanted to make sure that as we're putting direction to staff that that was that was included thank you did you get that chris did you get uh, yes, that chair. I, I, yes chair thank you i had that as a note uh, Commissioner i just wanted to chime in uh, and really support um a real push to focus more on resilience and adaptability. And I and I actually think that um, it's a very smart way to get at some of the equity issues. And I also think it's uh, maybe the best way to engage more people quickly. It's, it's in some ways the missing link in terms of what Hima had to say at the beginning. And I think it was really critical. So uh, I think over time, uh, the resilience and adaptability piece ought to become almost like a, a very critical pillar of all of this. And I think we'll move faster and we'll bring more people along more quickly if we do so. Thank you. Chairwoman Dana Carr, if I uh, could just make a couple of comments there. I, I really appreciate the discussion about resiliency and uh, Commissioner Wilkin bringing up the connection to the safety element. And uh, Chris brushed over it pretty quickly, but I think it's Im important to uh, highlight that uh, this team uh, before you tonight is also the team that is uh, taking the lead on, on the safety element and the resilient plan, uh, resilient slow. And um, that grant that we got, the climate adaptation grant that we got from Caltrans is a $400,000 plus grant that's gonna really, that we'll be able to leverage to really put together uh, a fantastic document. So th these comments on resiliency are really well taken. And in fact, we have a huge work program following up on this uh, to, to deliver on that. Um, just to connect the dots a little bit more, the um, state law actually requires with the uh, update of the climate action plan that we also um, uh, go forward with a safety element update and incorporate that resiliency component into the safety element. And uh, at your next meeting, you'll be reviewing the housing element update. Um, and there's a similar requirement. Uh, once a housing element is updated, that also triggers a uh, safety element update to comply with the new requirements for resiliency. So that's a great uh, topic that we'll be talking uh, a lot more about uh, in the future. And just wanna you know, thank the team here for putting together a, a great climate action plan and setting the stage for those future work efforts as well. So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, is there, are there any more comments on this agenda item? Thank you. I'm not seeing anybody uh, wanting to be heard. Uh, so um, may I have a motion and a second? Uh, Commissioner Hopkins. Yeah, I'd like to make the motion to adopt um, staff's recommendation um, as such adopting the climate action plan for community recovery uh, as consistent with the general plan, including uh, CEQA, GHG emissions thresholds and guidelines and adopt the associated initial study negative deck for the project. Do we have a second? So I'll second. 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 So um, any um, addendum, any, um, any additions that uh, people wish to make to this besides the guidance that has been given so far, which I assume is uh, the staff will be taking to council as, as advisory from us. Is that right, Chris? Yes, that's correct, Chair, thank you. So we don't have to formally make, build it into the motion. Um, I think unless the comments are focused on the, um, the CEQA component or the ISND, 
the the direction or the the suggestions provided by the planning commission will be uh, received and and I, I uh, really appreciate it and look forward to finding a way to incorporate it. Are commissioners comfortable with that? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So in that case, uh, will the deputy city clerk please call the roll of motion? Commissioner Hopkins. Yes. Vice Chair Jorgensen. Yes. Commissioner Kahn. Yes. Commissioner Quincy. Yes. Commissioner Shoresman. Yes. Commissioner Wolken. Yes. Chair Dondekar. Yes. The motion passes unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, item four on our agenda is staff updates and agenda for class. Um, will we be? Uh, All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair Dandekar. Uh, is my voice coming through clear? I just kind of took off the headset because my ears are getting sore. So I just want to make sure you can hear me all. Yes. All right. So it's Thank you. A couple of big items tonight. Really appreciate all the great uh, consideration and work you guys did on those. Um, very important projects, both of them each in their own way. Um, looking out uh, to the Planning Commission on 722, um, I have Brian Lavelle is going to fill in as the liaison that evening. I'm going to be out that night, but I will be reviewing the staff reports. But we do have three items scheduled for your consideration. One of them is the uh, San Luis Ranch Hotel component. Uh, of the specific plan. And so that will be moving forward with a recommendation from the Architecture Review Commission. We also have the draft housing element that will be back before your uh, consideration and recommendation to City Council. Uh, that document is now available on the city's website, along with the initial study, uh, which is a negative declaration that's associated with that project. And we're excited to uh, bring that forward. And then we also have a uh, subdivision it's a common interest subdivision at 1137 peach street and this is uh, a project where there are five existing single family homes and the project looks to subdivide and in, uh, into 10 lots common interest subdivision and add an additional five homes and so three items three uh fairly substantial items on your next meeting and then looking out to the planning commission meeting of august 12th we have two items the the main and, and significant item is the Froom ranch specific plan so wanted to make sure you're aware that that was on the 812 agenda we also have a special meeting that i'd like to get a poll from you guys um, doesn't have to be now it could be via email for a continuing uh, planning commission meeting on 813 so if you're not able to get through the Froom Ranch specific plan on 812. We would like to uh, roll into 813 if if we have a quorum to be able to consider um, that item if needed. And then we also have on 812 a conceptual review of a project at 600 Tank Farm Road. And that's a 275 unit mixed use development, and it's in the business park uh, airport area specific plan. And so that one is just kind of general feedback on the conceptual layout and design of the project. But looking um, again for your uh, availability potentially for 813 if needed. And so I'll kind of end the forecast on that date. Um, did just want to mention, I know we did have a technical difficulty to to start the uh, meeting tonight. So if we could try to log in uh, and try to get our, our uh, system set up maybe 10 minutes before we have our 6, uh, 6 p.m. start time, that would be helpful in case we have uh, other issues that do arise that, that would give uh, staff and, and our deputy city clerk some time to uh, try to uh, rectify those issues. So with that, uh, that's my update, but I would love to hear, um, you know, probably be email would be fine in the next day or two about your all availability on 813 if if we need to continue that Froom Ranch item uh, to get through that. And Thank that you. concludes. 
staff updates. Yep. Thank you very much, Tyler Corey. Um, great. If we can just shoot Tyler an email uh, and let, let, let him know about our availability for August 13th, if there's, we have to continue to any of the items of the two he mentioned. Um, so I think that brings uh, our meeting today to a conclusion. Uh, the next regular Planning Commission meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, July 22nd, 2020 at 6 p.m. by a teleconference again. Uh, so the screen I says Monday. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it is not Monday, it is Wednesday. I know, I just want to make sure everybody's clear on that. Wednesday, July 22nd, which is July 22nd is Wednesday, my calendar's saying. So for the record, that's when we will have the meeting. And I'd like to call this meeting to a close. Thank you very much. Oh, Thank I'll you. Be I'll be out that meeting. Just want to give you guys a heads up. OK, Tyler, so you need to keep the tab. Uh, and that, is that, was that the 22nd, uh, Nick? Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I can make the August 13th, so I don't need to email you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.